¿Tenemos, tenemos LEDs? Uf. Hello. Ah, no, todavía no. Okay. O sea, qué moderno está. todo, ¿no? Qué bien montado. Qué moderno todo y qué bien pensado. ¿Tú sabes si se puede compartirlo Instagram directamente? Sí. Aquí estamos. Hello. Silencio. A ver, silencio. Silencio. Ok. So we're live. I think. Here we are. Ok. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are starting the the second the second day of our international conference on wildlife conservation in human landscapes and uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, arthur arthur from safe elephants in in the czech republic and he's gonna talk about mitigation of human wildlife conflict in central africa uh, Welcome, Arthur, and, and uh, whenever you want. Yes, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be there with you, um, unfortunately, on distance. So I've recorded my presentation uh, uh, a few days ago uh, because of the poor internet connection. I'm actually now in, uh, in Congo. So I would like to uh, present you the, the pre-recorded presentation, and then I will be back to you uh once uh, once it's uh, finished in like 20 28 minutes i guess and i will be ready for your questions and remarks and of course uh now when uh, double thinking about what uh, i could have said better or precise more precise um, i regret uh, i regret that uh, i didn't include all the information so if you will have questions uh, especially about the figures of our projects about uh, some quantification of the of the results. Uh, I'm here to reply you once once the pre-recorded presentation is, is finished. So I would like to ask the the organizers whether they can they can play uh, and they can screen screen the recording. We are on it. <laughs> Ready. Okay, you can tell.
Hello everybody, I hope that you are having a great time back in Czech Republic. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, I regret I cannot be there in person and uh, please accept my kind and warm greetings from uh, Congo, um, specifically southern part near Brazzaville. Uh, my today's talk will be on behalf of the organization Safe Elephants, which is a Czech-based NGO focused on uh, conservation and supporting of conservation in Central Africa and uh, on behalf of the Zoo Liberec, which is uh, the oldest zoo in the Czech Republic uh, and our main partner since the beginning of our activities some 10 years ago from now. Uh, my presentation will be divided into three main parts. First, mm, regarding elephants, both species, uh, then uh, the so-called bushmeat crisis going on now, and then some specific aspects of the human wildlife conflict in Central Africa and some of our solutions. And uh, the talk will be partially a presentation of the known figures and facts in Central Africa and uh, my personal experience from a decade of working, volunteering and traveling in this part of the world. Now, talking about elephants, we have to consider that uh, nowadays there are two species uh, present in the Central African region. One of them, the most uh, better known and most spread it, uh, the bush elephant and uh, recently recognized forest elephants, uh, which uh, this year has been recognized by IUCN as a separate species. Unfortunately, when traveling uh, through Central Africa as an independent conservationist and traveler, uh, it happens that uh, you see more dead elephant carcasses than those uh, which are alive. And the main driver is, as you can guess, the trade in ivory, which is, uh, despite some positive changes in Asia, still the main threat to those elephant populations. And uh, interestingly, the average size of um, tusks today found on the black market worldwide is less than uh, two kilograms. It used to be much, much more in the past and now it's shrinking because of the heavy pressure, heavy poaching pressure. This map is actually uh, not up to date, but it more or less represents the current uh, distribution of both species of the African elephants combined. Uh, and it also doesn't give us uh, the correct information about the population densities and the total abundance of the elephants in the particular regions. For example, uh, the patch of elephants, of bush elephants in northern Botswana uh, comprise some 130,000 elephants, which uh, is a third of the total African, uh, African population size. Uh, what we know about elephants' numbers is not very accurate, but uh, some of the main, main information we have to take into account uh, come from the Great Elephant Census, finalized in 2016, which showed a 30% decrease in elephants' population size between 2007-2014 uh, in bush elephants and then even more dramatically a 62% decline of the forest elephant uh, numbers between 2002 and 2011. Uh, when we look in at those figures which show the pike index, pike meaning the proportion, uh, the proportion of illegally killed elephants, uh, carcasses on uh, Africa level are sampled and estimated which is the cause of the death and it shows that nowadays approximately still half of the carcasses are being poached and when the poaching crisis uh, was uh, culminate, culminating when it was at its, peak, at its peak around 2011 up to seven or eight uh, elephants uh, which have been uh, which have been found uh, dead have been killed illegally by poachers. That was uh, at the time when uh, I decided to, to try uh, be active in this, uh, in this regard and I founded with my colleagues and friends uh, this NGO which is active to, to date. Uh, the main 
main fight is, of course, the repression against uh, the black ivory market. Uh, on this graph, and now I see it's in check, but you would understand the, the, the huge increase in, uh, in price, uh, showing that uh, on the level of African poacher, those guys uh, calling the trigger don't really earn much. Then on the intermediate level, uh, in case of African uh, traffickers, then they can already get quite a lot of money out of it. And the real value of the ivory um, happens when it's, when it's uh, exported out of the continent, mainly to, to the Far East. Those trafficking routes uh, from the, from the EA uh, shows that majority, the vast majority of ivory goes to uh, East Asian countries, mainly mainland China, Hong Kong, Japan, Taiwan. Uh, the role of Vietnam is also increasing. Uh, on the other hand, Western Europe and the US, as it used to be the main important in the past, is nowadays uh, not a not, uh, uh, very important market. And even some of the seizures which uh, I have even made or witnessed in Central Africa shows that uh, the, the ivory coming from Central Africa is clearly destined to the to the African, sorry, to the East Asian market. Now talking more about some facilitators of the illegal trade, I have to, I have to note the logging, which is a legal activity in the Congo Basin. It is happening on the selective scale uh, with average one to two trees being extracted from one hectare, which is not a lot, but you have to take into account that uh, we got to approach each of the single trees and this means creation of vast road networks. This, this map shows uh, forestry concessions in the Republic of Congo where our project is mainly active and those concessions belonging to either Chinese or Malaysian or Singapore companies um, represent uh, more than 55% of the total forest uh, concession uh, area and it represents a big uh, threat to the local elephant and not only elephant populations because of the uh, steady presence of the Asian nationals and the, the presence of the of the exporting routes and, and so on and we have witnessed many times as here for instance that poachers are using those roads and those uh, logistic means to penetrate to the forest and to evacuate the merchandise out of it Another big threat is the mining, either legal or illegal, of uh, the resources such as gold or in the eastern DRC, eastern Congo, the Cassiterite or, or other main or important and valued metals and other articles. Uh, it doesn't only mm, represent a threat in terms of uh, human presence in the original pristine rainforests, and those people need to eat something. There is lack of infrastructure, of course. Uh, but of course, uh, the logging or the, the mining activities themselves create a big, uh, big degradation of the soil, of the of the rivers, and of course of the forest uh, itself. And now the third main facilitator is the corruption. Corruption maybe being the number one facilitator of the trade. Uh, as can be he seen here in Kinshasa, capital of the DRC, uh, with ivory being totally illegal but still uh, on the display just several several years ago uh, in the city center. Uh, now, several words about uh, our work in repression. This is a, a screenshot from our from our hidden video video being recorded by ivory traffickers in, in Congo a few months ago at the beginning of the year. This is the raw ivory which was on display for, for sale. It comes from the forest elephants. This is one of the main traffickers. Uh, originally, this is an ex-ranger from one of the national parks here in Congo who, who is presenting me now the merchandise, merchandise myself. Uh, trying to to get more evidence on him and uh, pretending to be interested in the, in the in the purchase, and now the arrival of the police forces, um, uh, which uh, arrested the suspects. Uh, in total, there were six 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 
suspects arrested, uh, three of them being in the military, uh, specifically the Congolese army uh, and, the, and the police and the gendarmerie working at the international airport and the, the ex-Echo Guard or ex-Ranger. Uh, so those persons were, were <clears throat> trafficking uh, ivory out of the country and within the country. Uh, we've seized uh, 101 kilogram of ivory. For some reason, the picture is not uh, appearing here for now. Uh, what's happening with the ivory once it's seized? And if it's not uh, re um, re-commercialized because of the corruption. Uh, it ends in the in the state magazines and in some occasions it is uh, being destroyed. As for example here some five five years ago in the city center of Brazzaville. Uh, this uh, piece is a wonderful source of information about the current trends in, in ivory poaching. Now I will move from the elephant crisis to the species which are being hunted mainly for the for the meat for the human consumption as you can see here on this uh, example elephants are usually killed purely for the ivory uh, the face is hacked off uh, using a machete or a chainsaw and the meat is is being uh, left without any without any um, further use of course, this might uh, change if, it is, if this is happening uh, close to the village, villages or human settlements. In this case, human civilian population can approach the site of poaching and can uh, cut off the, the entire meat, dry it and, uh, and then use it. But this is happening very rarely because most of the poaching, of course, is happening in the protected areas or on the periphery uh, of the areas with no... Um, steady or permanent human population. Dried elephant meat in Chad uh, seven years ago. So I said that elephants are not being killed for meat, unlike other species. Uh, when you imagine all other species, talking about mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, uh, all of them are being used for the so-called bushmeat trade. Uh, of course, the bushmeat hunting can be something very traditional, something very sustainable, as can be the case of the autochton of the indigenous people inhabiting the Congo Basin, uh, in the case of the Baka, Bayaka or Bagieli uh, pygmies. Uh, they use different, different means of hunting. It can be spear hunting, uh, it can be the net, hunt, net hunting, as you can see here, uh, the whole families, whole, communities uh, being at the same time in the forest creating big uh, net networks of the traditionally um, fabricated nets and then chasing small animals such as dikers, uh, porcupines or others for, for subsistence uh, consumption. Uh, species like uh, monitor lizards uh, but even carnivores uh, like a golden cat uh, and others can be more or less sustainably harvested using traditional techniques. Unfortunately, what we see nowadays is uh, widespread use of non-traditional techniques. Uh, metallic cables, metallic snares, uh, which, which are unselectively catching all sorts of animals, including uh, apes sometimes, is a big, big danger, and of course uh, firearms. Uh, fire, firearms are um, also as, as a heritage of uh, civil war, civil wars, but also due to corruption in the military military circles, available broadly on the Central African countryside, and they can be used not only for hunting small animals such as here, but also uh, to hunt our closest relatives, for instance chimpanzees, bonobos, or, or gorillas for meat. Uh, just a several months old uh, picture of, of our little friend in one village in southern Congo who revealed us that, uh, that his uncle recently killed a chimpanzee baby, chimpanzee cake baby for, for a soup. The problem is not only that uh, rare and protected and uh, threatened species are being targeted, but the main problem is the volume of uh, such uh, such bushmeat uh, trade, because uh, we have to 
we have to be aware that uh, most of the bushmeat doesn't uh, doesn't feed the local human population, but is being extracted some sometimes in really huge amounts, huge volumes, to the urban centers in Central Africa. For instance, here 400 kilo of partially smoked bushmeat uh, being transported to Pointe Noire in Congo. Here again, this is a map of the Cameroon, Central African Republic and Congo uh, borders showing the forest concessions and national parks, light, light gray national parks, forest concessions, uh, dark, gray, dark gray, with a vast network of uh, timber logging roads, which facilitates the, the fast evacuation of bushmeat, which is of course uh, decaying by time and the roads, vehicles, motorbikes, cell phones, all of this is facilitating the extraction. So it is no more the local people, local children and local population who is uh, eating most of the bushmeat, but the, the urban population. Uh, the rate of urbanization in Central Africa is particularly high. It accounts to between 60 and over 70 percent in those uh, countries around around equator and the problem is that most of the urban population population uh, doesn't have any adequate and any, uh, any alternative uh, source of uh, animal protein available the domestic animals are rare uh, to be uh, to be reared and the import of uh, of the meat from other parts of the parts of the world is problematic, non-economic, and of course not ecologic uh, uh, either. So, even the the population dwelling in the big uh, big capitals and big uh, centers are still dependent on the bushmeat. Um, it can be also a big threat in terms of uh, disease transmissions. Just uh, less than a year old pictures from uh, outskirts of Brazzaville and Kinshasa in Congo uh, and the chase or the hunting of the fruit bats, fruit bats which, are, which are known to transmit uh, Ebola virus, uh, coronaviruses and others. Um, here people in public transport wearing face masks, uh, uh, you know, respecting uh, distancing but carrying the, the cages with with freshly hunted fruit beds to the local market. Of course, uh, the bushmeat is being prepared in a in non-adequate non uh, manner, at, and it can be it it can be seen or we can we can see that uh, even the current or the past Ebola out outbreaks, such as here in Guinea, uh, seven seven or six years ago don't don't really limit the consumption of, of bushmeat in the local local populations and urban centers our reply in our organization and partners which was at the beginning the the eagle network represented by the PALF and later Aspinall foundation and even later Jengula institute and african parks was uh, the deployment of the sniffer dogs because those uh, sniffer dog units were able to accelerate our rate of the rate of success in uh, discovering hidden bushmeat being transported within the country and out of the country. Uh, a part of bushmeat, our dogs have been trained to sniff out weapons, ammunition and of course ivory as well. But the main volume of our seizures and of our intention was bushmeat. Either fresh, as here, uh, dead fruit beds, uh, sometimes alive, as here, dwarf crocodiles, uh, but mostly um, smoked, smoked pieces, uh, dissimulated in you know personal luggage and so on. Uh, since the project began in 2014, we've had two two litters in Congo of the Belgian Malinois dogs. So now we have the second generation already born to born to Congo, and sometimes the seizures have been really vast. Uh, Sometimes we've also um, targeted specifically on uh, controlling people working in the logging concessions, and it it proved to be to, to be a effective way of uh, of discovering, uh, for example, here ivory bracelets or pangolin scales. 
Now this figure shows uh, some of the taxa of mammals which are mostly threatened by the so-called bushmeat, bushmeat trade and pangolins up, up there are one of the most, uh, most threatened by, by bushmeat for human consumption. Uh, primates as well, mm, up to half of the primates are, are killed uniquely for, for bushmeat trade. In pangolins it's almost uh, 100%. Uh, those four uh, African and especially the three Central African species of pangolins are endangered, not yet critically endangered, not yet critically endangered as the Asian counterparts, uh, but this might unfortunately change in the near future, as the trade is still going on. Uh, despite the, the ban, despite the highest level of protection in Congo, the pangolins are still, be, are still being displayed, sometimes alive, some, sometimes dead, for, for the bushmeat trade. And of course, some people start to trade also in their scales. And the destination for the scales is mainly the East Asian market. Uh, fortunately, some of the or big proportion of the pangolins are being seized alive, so we are able to to release them release them back to the wild. Uh, and now, at the end of the bushmeat uh, part of our presentation, uh, in the background you can see the African brush brushtail porcupine. Mm, still quite common species, hunt, uh, hunted frequently for the bushmeat and nowadays also for the bezoars. The bezoars, uh, let's say like stomach stones or intestine stones uh, of uh, undigested food and other, other uh, materials are highly valued uh, recently on the East Asian, mainly Indonesian, Malaysian market and these are my undercover pictures of uh, Malaysian nationals trading in the in the pangolins, pangolin bezoars. It can be a big threat for those uh, species as well. And of course, uh, when talking about uh, hunting of primates, here mandrills, gorillas, this is a hand of the silverback of the western lowland gorilla, or chimpanzees, it brings, uh, it brings also um, the ape or primate or ape babies to the market. In the past it used to be a, uh, a valued byproduct for the hunters and traffickers. Nowadays, because of the awareness campaigns and the repression, the number of uh, primate, especially ape, ape uh, orphans on the market is limited, but still even today we can see, we can see such uh, heartbreaking images in Central Africa. But uh, thanks to Jen Goodall Institute and other organizations, this is still uh, this is going on more and more rarely. Uh, and the reply, the response to the bushmeat hunting, of course, it must be repression, it must be awareness campaigns. But first of all, which I personally b believe should be um, development of some alternative source of uh, animal protein and uh, and employment, respectively. So. Since the uh, beginning of this year, we are also involved in the uh, creation of an eco-farm, uh, also in uh, collaboration or being uh, uh, supported by the Czech Development Agency. And we want to produce uh, domestically reared animal meat for, for, local, for local market. And we also, also participate in, uh, in awareness campaigns, of course. And now for the couple for the last five minutes of my presentation, briefly about the human wildlife conflict which is going on. And now I will leave the Congo Basin and I will move more northwards to southern Chad and northern Cameroon, where clashes between the megafauna and humans uh, appear. Uh, one of our projects which we started to deal with uh, beginning now, 2021, is penetration of hippos, the amphib amphibious hippos, to the farms of local local farmers in Chad. So we've selected uh, one area with quite heavy disturbances from the from the hippopotamuses on the local small scale small scale farms and 
in collaboration with a local NGO, which we know from several years ago, we've started to build uh, electric fencing around parts of the, of the selected uh, fields. We've selected the most fertile and most valued uh, parts of the land uh, and circled them with metallic, metallic barriers uh, and the electricity comes from solar-fed uh, stations, I mean, uh, solar panels-fed uh, stations. Uh, we've selected three sites on both sites of the, on both uh, sides of the Logon River in southern Chad, uh, altogether approximately 60 hectares. And at the end of the year, we will see the final results. Uh, till now, it seems that the fencing is working uh, quite effectively. There are only few cases of penetrations uh, from the hippopotamuses inside, probably due to some. Uh, mm -hmm some failures in uh, in the electricity power or or the the voltage being being uh, uh, present so what we will try to do this is like a pilot experiment uh, which should um, which should show us whether or not uh, this system works against hippopotamuses and then in the future years we will think more about which parts of the land should we should we protect which part on the other hand uh, we will need to leave for the wildlife use and the hippopotamus passages and so on so this is we are this is a very very first phase of this project uh, not far from that one from from that initiative we are also involved in um, management of of the wildlife and and, uh, unfortunately, vegetation on the Lake Lere in uh, in southern Chad. Uh, there is a big threat of the water hyacinth, the Eichhornia crassipes, uh, invasive species originally from South America. Uh, you will probably very you will be also familiar with that from other parts of the world, which is now starting to spread in the lake on the lake and cover substantial patches, which can which can be a big threat to the local wildlife and especially to the local relic, relic population of the West, uh, West African manatees. This is the only place in the whole Chad, probably an isolated, isolated population, and we are starting to collect more data about that. Um, of course, we also witnessed some, uh, some poaching, low level of poaching probably, uh, but still some poaching uh, because of the oil or the grease, the, the fat layer, which is valued on the black market with local traditional medicine. So with non-invasive methods, collecting of the, of the uh, feces samples and acoustic monitoring, we will try to find out more about the manatees in that lake and uh, take more actions about, uh, about that. And now our last, but already or any, like traditional activity in Chad uh, is the protection of the fields against elephants. Um, we use the biological beehive fence method, which has been being which has been tested in East Africa since uh, six or seven years ago by Lucy King from Save the Elephants, and we have transmitted this knowledge to Central Africa. Uh, <clears throat> so we work here in Chad since 2015 with local associations. And we transform the local beekeeping in traditional beehives from straw uh, or, or clay. And we use uh, more modern methods, the Kenyan top bar hives, which are, which are easily accessible um, for multiple, multiple honey harvesting throughout the year. Uh, and this can also increase, of course, increase the, the yields in honey. Uh, the method is quite simple. You get to encircle the whole field or village uh, by beehives, 10 meters from each other maximum. They are interlinked or interconnected by wire or another, another, another cord. When the elephants uh, try to pass, they, uh, they shake or they sometimes totally destroy the, the beehive. And of course, the bees protect themselves, they protect the hives and attacked, at, they attack in vast numbers, thousands of individuals, the, the penetrator. Uh, so far, this project works, uh, works very well. Local people are 
are happy that uh, we brought them another source of incomes in in the form of honey and uh, each year we multiply we don't multiply we increase the number of uh, of fields and communities which are involved to that project so still looking for some new uh, new col collaborations on the local scale and new source of finances finances to to accelerate uh, such a project well that was uh, in short what we've been doing in central africa uh, since uh, since now nearly 10 years and i will now be available for your questions remarks and uh, and discussions have a wonderful time and uh, my kind greetings back to czech republic Ah, okay. Now, so thank you for for your presentation, Arthur. <laughs> it's been uh, very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Lots of interesting work. So now we open the room to to ah. questions. Uh -huh. So, anyone having questions? Okay. So we have one. Hi, Arthur. <laughs> Hello. Who comes here? Yeah. Okay. Arthur, I would like to ask if you see any changes in uh, bushmeat consumption after the COVID time. If you can say even now this change or not, or if you see any differences. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, tough to evaluate all the trends uh, going on now within the last year or two. And from my personal impression, but as I said, this is not uh, backed by some hard data. My personal impression is that uh, here in the Congo Basin, uh, there is no like positive effect in uh, reduction of the bushmeat consumption. Uh, there are several exceptions that some communities, some traders, especially those in the urban centers, tend to avoid some species like uh, pangolins. So maybe in the top restaurants in, in the city center, Brazzaville or Kinshasa, they, there would be less pangolins uh, uh, available, you know, for the, for the higher, high clientele. But it doesn't mean that the um, hunting level of pangolins is, has been decreased because of that, because of course the, the hunter can uh, either consume it uh, on his own or he can uh, sell it to the local market. So th there are maybe some minor changes uh, but uh, not a drastic decrease. But it will be better to consult some long-term studies carried out by WCS or African parks in in this part of the world to be more to be more accurate. But I, I, I as far as I'm aware, uh, there are very few few up-to-date evidence about this. Hi, Arthur. Uh, I would like to ask you if you could tell us uh, which partners do you uh, cooperate with? I mean, with the government or other NGOs? Or, and uh, another question is, what is the biggest challenge for you to, uh, to operate in this, in this part of Africa? What is the biggest challenge maybe now for you? Mm -hmm. the, the scale or the range of our partners is pretty vast. Um, let's say that on the, when talking about the repression, about the undercover investigations, it is mainly done in collaboration with the Eagle Network, uh, which is an international NGO based in Kenya, uh, working in Central and West Africa. Uh, we also um, collaborate with the local state institutions, notably the Gendarmerie, so like the police force and the Ministry of uh, Environment, let's say. Uh, but this is only on Punctual um, level, level, I mean, punctual operations, investigations, and so on. Um, on the other hand, on the long-term basis, and, and now talking about uh, the sniffer dog project, we've been collaborating, uh, especially with the Jane Goodall Institute here in Congo and uh, the African Park Network, uh, represented by the Odzala Odzala Kokoa National Park here. Um, while some other projects, especially those who are uh, recent or, 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 you know, or new in our portfolio of activities, uh, the camera trapping, the, um, 
I mean, other forms of biomonitoring and the, the human wildlife mitigation or human wildlife conflict mitigation things. We collaborate with smaller NGOs, locally based organizations of, uh, you know, local people trying to do to some change in their environment. And these organizations are acknowledged by local governments uh, here in Congo or north in Chad. So we, we create partnerships with them uh, officially or non-officially on a personal basis. And we, we support them in their activities by our know-how, by our materials to a certain extent, by our finances and also human, I mean, manpower. Uh, our volunteers or experts in the fields in the field and the biggest challenge yes and the main challenge is the steady steady need of improvisations of all levels you can imagine it's a, a very unstable environment to work here uh, the collaborations with um, especially the I mean, government structures is nothing uh, easy to be carried out from the you know from the desk uh, um, just it's an it's another style of of communication and uh, one has to be very very patient uh, and passionate about what he's doing otherwise he would lose the courage and motivation very soon and this is what i actually see around that uh, many people newcomers or enthusiastic people coming here to this part of the world uh, sooner or later they they give up because the the system here is really not functioning well. Uh, it's functioning somehow, of course, uh, but uh, through different uh, liaisons and links, mm -hmm. some of them are like corruption link, of, of course, but also on the good side, um, you have to find our, our solutions than we are used to, used to um, used for in, in Europe or like the Western part of the world. Hi, Arthur. Uh, one of the goals of the conference uh, in Glasgow uh, was to stop deforestation up to 2030 all over the world. What do you think that will happen in Congo Basin and Africa as you know in practice? Will something happen according to this? Yes, uh, that's a it, it's a wonderful opportunity to to create to um, push. Uh, some other and bigger changes. And uh, what we see now in the neighboring uh, Gabon, uh, which is a country um, comparable in size, human population, um, and many other figures uh, to Congo, which, which I'm mainly talking about. Uh, so Gabon has uh, its own system of uh, wildlife management, of uh, protected area management. Everything is under one agency, which makes uh, the issue pretty easier than, than here in Congo. Uh, but in general, they have very I mean, they have uh, a lot of similarities uh, with Congo. And uh, what they now, um, what they are now doing is that uh, they've been receiving uh, substantial amounts of money from uh, Western donors. Specifically, it was Norway, which donated first chunk of a huge amount, the first part of one, 150 or 160 uh, million US dollars. And uh, this is to ensure better protection of the forest and continue in the good practice. Meaning that uh, Gabon, of course, is, is exploiting the forests, but in a let's say sustainable way or near to sustainable way, uh, there is still space to improve, of course. Um, and the logging going on there, um, not now not talking about some uh, exceptional errors and uh, bad practices, but in general, they, they do selective logging or they really control the amount, the, the, the species composition, the diameter of the, of, the, of the timber exploited from the forest. And uh, the international community and Norway in this case particularly, uh, tried to support such a good practice by donating money uh, to improve conservation and um, controlling mechanism in this country. So what I expect, if this uh, concept will prove to be successful, and a win-win situation for both sides, we might see this happening in other countries as well. Um, 
Congo also, I mean, now we're talking about Congo Brazzaville, um, vast majority of the forest, forest, forest covered surface is uh, divided into logging concessions. Uh, I think yeah, there was a map of it in my presentation. And uh, in most of them, there is a big space for, for improvements. So from my perspective, uh, I expect uh, that maybe some new protected areas with no human touch will, will appear. That will be wonderful. But already the, 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 the steady, I mean, the, the current number and the uh, total size of the protected areas is not bad. You know, it, it's like a big, uh, big percentage, big proportion of the countries. So if this is uh, really grasped uh, responsibly and if those neighboring forests are managed are managed in a more sustainable way via sustainable selective logging that would be a solution to yeah to 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 enable the the, the wildlife to sustain here uh, of course there are countries which are very problematic looking across the river to DRC Democratic Congo or Central African Republic I really, I have, I'm not entitled to, to preview what will happen there because these are very, very difficult countries. I have, I have a question concerning the keeping. Uh, was it the uh, beehives, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, was it the tradition that the people use beehives to produce the honey in the era or something completely new for them? And uh, how is it uh, with the taking care about beehives? It's done by community or there is some person who have it like his job after it or... And do you monitor somehow uh, if, if, if they really use it and, and, and Thank you for these questions, and I, I admit that because of lack of lack of time, I, I I didn't say everything what I what I wanted to say regarding these last projects, the the human wildlife mitigations. Um, the tr the beekeeping has been a traditional activity to some ethnic groups in southern Chad, uh, using some traditional methods uh, like dug out. Uh, uh, pumpkins, uh, the calabas or the straw hives, uh, or using, of course, uh, natural cavities to, uh, you know, for the, for the bees, and then <clears throat> once in a while collect the honey. Uh, none of it has been really done in a manner which, which would uh, enable to harvest twice or, or multiple times the same hive. So it always required destruction of the beehive or the bee colonies, taking all the honey and you know chase them away. So um, it has been problematic and only known to several ethnic group and several individuals. Uh, despite the big in incentives in honey, because uh, the price is really uh, high and uh, steadily increasing, comparable to prices in the Czech Republic, for instance. Uh, so we've transformed the way of, of using honey, uh, honeybees. Uh, so we've introduced the new type of hives and usually on the community level, we've selected individuals who are, who are interested to participate and we've given them the, the starting needs. The materials, you know, we provided the, food, the, the wood, which is uh, also a limiting factor in chat. Uh, it has to be, uh, maybe in the future, using another material would be better, but uh, wood is pretty expensive in, in, in this country. And uh, then when, when the barrier around a selected part of the, of the community land has been, has been erected mm -hmm. and colonized, uh, usually very often, within two weeks, most of, the, most of the beehives are really colonized naturally. We don't have to introduce them artificially. We just wait and the bees come in, which is, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, feature. And uh, uh, we have a local collaborator uh, from the veterinary background, uh, like our field, field agent, which is, who is monitoring the successes. In general, we can say that uh, the yields of honey from this new or the 
modernize the type of uh, beehive uh, is double or triple than the previous yields from the traditional hives. And it is much easier to collect, you know, so it has multiple advantages and the bees uh, remain there if, if, when it's properly done, if you don't really destroy it uh, excessively. So in terms of honey production, definitely yes. And in terms of uh, mitigation of the penetrating elephants, as I said, we lack hard data because the, the area is really remote. Uh, usually those people don't have cell phones. Our field agent, uh, he cannot be everywhere at the same time. So many of the evidence are anecdotal, unfortunately. So we cannot really measure it uh, like scientifically uh, as I, I would wish, but we have, uh, we have you know, accounts that uh, it has been drastically improved since the, since the beehives are there. But of course we have also other issues. The region is ethnically not uh, unified and they are uh, apart from those sedentary agriculturists, we have nomadic herders like a Fulani or, or Arabic tribes uh, uh, grazing their, their, their uh, stock uh, and their, their cattle. And they regularly destroy the, sometimes the hives uh, because the bees also attack uh, cattle. Uh, or they steal the they steal the wire, or they just destroy the fencing. Because I, I love the people uh, in general, but in some situations they are problematic because they don't understand why the barrier is there, and uh, uh, they can just detour it. So it will require more more work on this community level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you about the ostriches as an alternative to the bushmi. I didn't uh, notice whether this was in Chad or in Congo, but I think that if ostriches are more like savanna species. Can they be bred in in the humid conditions of Congo? Or yes, uh, thank you. Um, this project, which we now, uh, we, which we are starting, is in, in the Congo, um, uh, indeed, uh, in the southern part of the Congo, which is, as you can see on the satellite image, predominant, pre predominantly covered by savanna, and the precipit, the preci precipitation rate is also not huge. It's like 1,200, 1, uh, you know, uh, 300 millimeters per year. There is quite a long uh, dry season. And uh, from experience uh, from other countries, Malaysia, Brazil, Nigeria, uh, ostriches can thrive well uh, also in more humid uh, conditions than usual. So we are placing the project here. Of course, uh, it would be maybe easier, maybe even more, um, maybe the production of ostriches would be faster and more with easier in Chad or in more savanna or more Sahel-like environment. But the problem there is that uh, we would have hard times in, uh, in uh, being able to sell the meat for good price, which, was, which would en enable us to run the project. Because unlike Congo and other equatorial, originally forest areas, Chad is uh, well known to, to have like 10 folds more cattle than human population. There is like surplus of, uh, of meat mm -hmm. from uh, beef, uh, goats, camels, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem there is not the lack of meat itself. The, the problem there is lack of uh, uh, good distribution or a fair distribution, uh, you know, and I would talk more about it, but it's a, it's a complicated story. So we, we place the project here to Congo because mm -hmm. here there really, there is the lack of uh, meat. People, people want to, to buy it, they just don't have alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true that ostriches can thrive well even in our conditions. So even in snow, you know, yeah, even in yeah, snow. So yeah. <laughs> we, believe, we, we believe it's a viable, viable method. And now uh, I'm here actually, especially to, to move this project for, forward. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Just 
Yeah, of course, there is a threat of that. But so far, since the beginning in May, uh, those solar panels are there. One of them has been somehow destroyed by by a lightning, probably. But it, it was not. It was a natural cause. We've been re- we've replaced it, and uh, so far, so good. It works, and yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, and, and thank you especially you. <laughs> thank, thank you for the invitation and enjoy the. I can't be there. I, I have to run to the field right now, and uh, uh, I would be happy to see the presentations later, if possible. It was clearly a, a very interesting talk, and, and there might be many more questions in the minds of, of all the people. But what we can do is to collect them and, and maybe contact you maybe tomorrow. Can be. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's go with the next lecture. Uh, the next is called Refuge Environmental Land and it's from Krakow, and he's in the way. Okay. So. Uh, the next is called Refuge Environmental Land and it's from Krakow and it's in the way that it is ready for us. Okay. Hello, good morning. Thank you for, for your patience. It's, <laughs> it's always the same with, with conferences. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's perfectly fine. I'm, uh, I'm sorry not, uh, for not being there with you, which I was originally uh, planning, but I uh, got stuck. Uh, Okay. Hello, good morning. Thank you for, for your patience. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's, 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 it's <laughs> fine. I'm, uh, I'm sorry not, uh, for um, not being there with you, which I was originally uh, planning. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, it's, it's off. off. It's, it's off. off. Yes, you turn off yours. <laughs> Okay. Yes, sometimes we get all these echoes and we don't know which of the seven computers is coming now. from. <laughs> <laughs> I think we don't hear you. First of all, I have to, I have to uh, quit. Uh, I probably have to quit my uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, am I supposed to, to share share uh, my screen desktop? Yes, you already can. Share screen. Okay, I'll try. Here we go. Hey. Okay. Perfect. So. Uh, okay, I have to scroll a little bit. <laughs> At the beginning. So you can you can hear me? Yes, mm-hmm. perfectly. Okay, okay. Okay, so, so all yours. All right, all right. So I'll I'll try to be. I understand that we're uh, in a slight. Uh, uh, delay, so I'll I'll try to be quick. Uh, basically, um, uh, I was invited for this uh, conference to present uh, uh, present, uh, let's say, position of a private investor in um, in environmental uh, in uh, environmental protection. So uh, I, I would like to introduce to you uh, my fund, which I'm starting at the moment. Uh, the, the, the whole uh, presentation is in uh, present uh, tense, but uh, this is more, let's say, this is more happening at the moment. Uh, uh, I'm just uh, starting this fund and not everything is ready yet. But uh, basically uh, the fund refugium is environmental land, land fund and um, uh, uh, this fund is to be a portfolio of naturally valuable habitats in the Czech Republic. 
Uh, these lands are characterized by their exceptional biodiversity and the presence of species of European importance. At the same time, uh, they provide indispensable local ecosystem functions. Uh, Refugium seeks to protect and restore these habitats based on uh, ESG principles, which is green, responsible, and sustainable investment strategies. Um, uh, basically, we all realize that uh, our planet's wildlife uh, is disappearing and the staggering rate. And by joining the Refugium Fund, I believe that investors can act actively participate on uh, in savings uh, uh, in uh, in saving it for the future generations. Uh, maybe I uh, maybe I should. Uh, started uh, maybe without introducing myself. Uh, my name is Prokop Svoboda and uh, my background is in, uh, I'm a businessman, my background is in real estate, I live in Prague and uh, also I consider myself as an amateur uh, biologist. So that's uh, where this idea came from and uh, the idea is um, of establishing uh, the fund uh, is coming from my lifelong interest in, in nature, specifically wetlands and steppes, which are demonstrably the most endangered in the Czech Republic today. Uh, wetlands and water retention have recently been discussed from A to Z, whether in the context of landscape, landscape adaptation to climate change, uh, small water cycle, or the loss of uh, biodiversity. Similarly, the protection of steppes and dry, dry grasslands is a key uh, is key to preserving our natural heritage. Um, I believe that investing uh, in these types of land uh, is worthwhile, uh, environmentally responsible, as they can act as a natural uh, preservers of financial resources. And a society becomes more and more aware of um, the natural value of these disappearing habitats. Uh, it can rightly be assumed that their financial value will, uh, will also increase. Um, this is pretty much uh, here you can. Uh, uh, here you can uh, see me on the left and my colleagues uh, digging a ditch to prevent uh, agrochemical runoff from surrounding fields into habitat uh, during the heavy rains. So, of course, part of um, part of the fund is is not only uh, buying and creating this portfolio of. Uh, of naturally valuable land, but also uh, management, uh, revitalization, and of course, sustainability. Um, uh, the goal funds, uh, uh, as you can, uh, as you can also read here, it's uh, purchasing uh, naturally valuable lands and managing uh, them in cooperation with experts. Uh, preserving our natural and cultural heritage for future generations, tradition, traditional um, organic uh, agriculture, uh, protecting non-productive functions of water, forests, and farmland, improving ecosystem services, water regime, natural water retention, flood and extreme drought prevention, local climate uh, recreation. Uh, growing environmental awareness among uh, stakeholders, uh, local communities, and general public, and of course, reducing our uh, carbon footprint. I don't. Uh, I think we we all understand uh, the threats uh, uh, to the modern landscape. I think I don't need to go through this sli slide. I think it's, it's pretty clear that uh, it's loss of natural habitats. It's a uh, high impact on chemicals, air and water pollution, extensive eutroph eutroph eutrophication of the environment, uh, loss of traditional landscape structure, industrial husbandry, large scale farming, uh, invasion of non native uh, plants, predators, and competitors. Water and wetland, uh, wetlands are rapidly disappearing uh, from our intensively farmed uh, landscape. And with them, uh, wetland species, uh, amphibians, birds, insects, uh, or plants. Am I still there? I'm sorry. 
Uh, yes, all, all going good. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Can you because because I only see myself at the moment. Okay, um, uh, this is about um, about the fund itself. You know, um, uh, uh, we are. Um, it's it's me and a um, few of uh, my friends and colleagues. Uh, we are currently in the process of founding. Uh, an investment company registered uh, at the Czech National Bank on the paragraph 15 of the Act on Investment Funds. Um, it's a type of uh, alternative investment fund, and um, and um, the fund already owns uh, um, a portfolio of land uh, of. I think increasing value, the current uh, estimated value of the portfolio is approximately 15 million crowns. And uh, the fund is planning to invest approximately 10 million crowns per year, unless, unless we have some uh, uh, more ambitious investors around who, who want to contribute uh, the bigger, bigger amounts. Um, uh, this is, let's say, the basic expectation of uh, the fund uh, growth. Uh, I believe that um, um, I believe that uh, the green stock or green bond uh, can uh, 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 can uh, basically improve why investors basically why why someone should invest in a fund that pretty much uh, at the moment has no income. Uh, the the only the only performance of the fund is a is a capital gain. Basically, the fund is buying some land, and the value of land generally is growing. So there is some performance, but uh, there is no cash flow. Uh, which, which if we talking conservative uh, investment fund, it would be pretty much nonsense. Uh, however, there are there are some assets uh, in the investment world that produce no income that only. Uh, represent uh, value preservation. So the, the 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 performance of the fund is based on um, on uh, the capital gain. Also, in the future, the fund has uh, has uh, uh, ambition to to be involved in uh, in organic farming. So in the future, we believe there will be some income, even some cash flow. But at the moment, it's a it's a it's a value preserver, and we believe that uh, the motivation, the ma the main motivation for for the investors, should be uh, the fact that uh, green stock uh, or green bond can improve rating of their investment portfolio, especially these days when where the ESG principles are discussed on a daily basis. Uh, so this would be the the, the main uh, most likely the main motivation for the investors. Uh, but at the same time, it can be a question of uh, social responsibility, environmental statement, or just becoming of the community, community around the fund. So um, uh, this is pretty much about uh, the, the, the fund uh, itself. Of course, the fund should uh, would be regulated. Um, it, it is uh, it, it's it's registered with Czech National Bank, and there there is there there has to be some regulation. We plan on uh, investment committee, expert environmental experts, advisors. Uh, this 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 should be uh, the fund should have a pro proper structure from that perspective. And uh, as far as the securities, the fund should uh, should uh, issue. Uh, shares and green bonds. L shortly about uh, the current portfolio of lands, we are, we are, I would say we are at the very beginning, but we already, the fund already uh, made two acquisitions. One is a land uh, which is uh, in South Bohemia. Uh, the, the site is called uh, Zakovarno. It's a plot of uh, a totaling 7.2 hectares in Matish in uh, The village of Matish uh, lies on the border with Austria, on the historic tree border between uh, Bohemia, Moravia, and Austria, three, kilometer, three kilometers south from the uh, town of Slavonice. Um, 
at the moment, uh, this uh, here is a. Uh, uh basically uh here is a here there you say you, you see um this uh, diagram or this uh, this land scheme uh the the plot uh, consists of um of wet meadow uh mesophilic meadow beaver marsh uh, all the car and uh and some wood, wood plants uh, on, on on the left uh, uh, it's uh, it is located in a in an important uh, spring area. Uh, water enters the area via uh, three tributaries and several springs. Uh, um, the, the, the 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 site uh, uh, con uh, contains this uh, beaver marsh, which is particularly interesting. Uh, uh, and signifying a shift back to wildlife and uh, the establishment of many natural and self-regulating uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, also, uh, such a large biotope uh, with this exceptionally well-preserved water regime provides uh, a maximum level of uh, ecosystem services uh, in the form of water retention, self-cleaning, cooling effects and a source of biodiversity. Uh, due to its location and size, um, it can largely function independ independently, which is rare, which is quite rare in today's landscape. On the other hand, uh, decades of uh, pure land management have resulted into degradation of the original grassland habitats uh, and uh, something like new wilderness uh, uh, appeared. Um, we, are, we, are, we are in the process of, uh, of uh, uh, we are in the process of land consolidation, Celavani Pozemku, land consolidation. Uh, we are at the moment in negotiations with the owners of the of the neighboring uh, land, so uh, very likely we will be able to uh, to buy more of the car woodlands. And you see on the on the west there is a, there is a pond that should be that should become part of this uh, uh, this habitat. And also we are uh, in negotiations with the with the farmland owners on the south. So th th there's, a, there's a pretty good chance that we would create a more buffer zone, bigger buffer, zo uh, buffer zone for, for, for the site itself. Um, so this is uh, the land in, uh, in, uh, in Marish. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the area's water regime is, is, is very, very good. Uh, here we have few pictures of the uh, all the cars. Uh, this is the uh, beaver marsh. Uh, uh, on the left, the picture it's also part of the beaver marsh. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, is a wet meadow. Uh, area which is uh, mostly overgrown with uh, wood club rush. Uh, we are uh, we begin uh, regularly moving this 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 wet meadow, so uh, we're planning to improve uh, improve situation there for for plants. Um, we made uh, our friend. Uh, Philip Lissac, uh, biologist, uh, made a botanical survey in the spring. We found a uh, few interesting uh, protected endangered plant species. Um, um, I, I, I suppose you can read the names. Uh, I wouldn't go for reading in English. Bazanovets, Kitko Květy, Vachta Trojlista, Zábělík Bahení, Pasterči Patoční. Those are... Uh, the, the the most uh, significant uh, discoveries in terms of uh, botanical survey 
Uh, also, uh, last, oh no, no, last, this February, we created eight uh, amphibian pools uh, in cooperation with uh, Spolek Mokřady from Jihlava. Uh, the pools are, uh, um, were immediately colonized by uh, tree frogs, um, agile frogs, and smooth newts. Uh, also, we made herpetological uh, survey in uh, cooperation with um, Spolek uh, Zamenis, uh, who we have also uh, uh, as Radka uh, from, uh, from Zamenis is, is part of this conference. Um, so uh, Radka helped us, uh, helped me to, to monitor uh, the the amphibians on on the on, in the site uh, there is a there is a decent list of uh, of amphi amphibians also we expect other species to yet to discover for example uh, arana arvales which is uh, which which is uh, which we haven't uh, spotted yet on this side but uh, but uh, in a uh, in neighborhood or in the, in the, in the area, in the location, uh, there were some foundings uh, uh, based on uh, the uh, AOPECA database, uh, uh, which is a species, uh, species uh, occurrence database uh, of uh, the Natural Conservation Agency of the Czech Republic. So we expect, uh, and this habitat uh, seems almost perfect for Arana Arvales, so we expect this species to appear, plus uh, there are a few more that uh, we have a uh, good assumption that um, those species uh, should be part of the location. Uh, Plus, there is a there is a second um, second plot uh, or a second um, piece of land which is a very new, which is which become very newly part of the portfolio, which are uh, ponds uh, near Jakubov village, uh, which is in uh, in Karlovy Vary region. Uh, the area is for, of four seven point four hectares. Uh, the site uh, consists uh, three ponds, a water source, meadows, and brushland uh, in the valley of uh, the Ohře River by the border of uh, Vojenský uest Hradiště military zone. And the site is significant for its high level of biodiversity, including uh, the iconic species of the Střední Pohoří area, uh, the uh, Isculapian uh, snake, Saminus longissimus, uh, so this is this is the most recent uh, acquisition which we are quite happy of. Uh, I show you a few pictures. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a nice piece of wildlife uh, with um, with big potential for uh, upgrading uh, the environmental situation there. That's pretty much it. So uh, thank you for your attention and uh, and a little bit of uh, of. Uh, uh, a private investors view. Thank you, Franco. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franco. You can stop sharing now. Hmm. Yes. Let's see. It's uh, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what having leverage, having leverage, can do so much more for conservation. You can try to to work on a on a very small area and trying to 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 push your project, but sometimes creating a big fund and, and purchasing land is probably the most efficient way to protect. So it's yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, I think it's at the moment, it's, uh, it's quite an experiment, you know, and uh, when I speak to, uh, to people about this and maybe even to some potential investors. Everybody seems uh, interested, uh, but I think it, it's it's going to take time. And I will put. Uh, I'm, I'm planning to put more, more uh, to to build this uh, portfolio to make it bigger and more relevant. And also, uh, uh, I try to create community of experts uh, helping me with this project. You know, so uh, once we have uh, some uh, relevant uh, references for for the management and. Uh, and revitalization. Uh, then I think uh, I believe that uh, this can uh, this can be this can be real real uh, investment fund. 
It looks great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to open the, the room for questions. Okay. So, at the meantime, can you please proc off, stop uh, sharing screen? Excuse me? Can you stop the screen? Uh, okay, screen? okay, 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 okay. Okay. So we can see the audience in the. Sure. sure. I try to jump out. Yes, uh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Okay, okay, here. Okay, so. Question? Um, yeah. Okay. So Hello, I would like to ask maybe I don't understand properly how it's working. So I would like to know who are the investors, if they are the owner of the land, the investing. And how is the secure that they will not use the land for their own purpose? Like it will be not in any of the way. Like how is this is working? Because I don't understand actually the, the system of the investors and the owner of the land. Okay. Uh, at the moment, it's only uh, me myself. Um, I I think uh, I uh, I know that I have to start somewhere, so I'm uh, using my private uh, resources, financial resources, and bu I'm buying such uh, habitats or such uh, sites. And uh, uh, the moment I open the fund, uh, basically, I expect uh, people. Either, either they they find it um, useful and environment responsible, uh, or they even see some uh, financial potential behind it. I expect uh, some investor to, to join me, but at the moment it's me myself, and I have to, I, I think I have to put first uh, a portfolio which is relevant and which makes sense, and um, then I believe that uh, there might be investors from the outside joining me. Again, uh, I I I try to explain. Maybe I wasn't clear enough uh, what, what should be the motivation for the investors. Either they like the project and this is sort of charity for them, or I think in today's uh, investment world, it's, it's, it, starts, it starts to be more and more important to be, to be environmental responsible, basically uh, from, from a perspective of this ESG strategy, uh, which, uh, which there, is a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a high pressure, and I think there'll be more and more pressure on investors to buy green bonds on, or green assets. You know? And it's, it, this is not necessarily that, that, that such uh, asset in their portfolio would perform some income, would create some... Uh, this, this is going to be more about the ratings that investors have with their banks and with their investors. So I believe that uh, this could be very, uh, this, I can create interesting uh, green, uh, green asset uh, that would uh, basically help investors to improve uh, ratings of their, uh, of their portfolios. And uh, in the investment board, it's of course those uh, those lands in the portfolio will produce if they produce an income. It's going to be very small income, maybe from uh, from uh, from some uh, eco farming and uh, uh, and uh, maybe um, uh, maybe we can sell some uh, some uh, biomass. But uh, but uh, it's more about the the value of the the property it's called capital gain in czech it's uh it's the term is uh is uh capital of as or not saying capital you know so you don't need, you don't necessarily need to have an income from the rent or you don't need to necessarily have a, a cash flow but the performance of the fund can be based on the of the on the on the fundament itself you know and it's a uh, it's a uh, it's this uh gain um, um, capital gain. Any other questions? Mm, yeah, probably I have a question. If, for example, um, like, how you think about investors? Can it be like that some like people who have just some small income can <clears throat> join it and, and be like some? Small investor in your group, and, and if you funding. think, for example, about some limit, how 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 much money you can invest to be in your fund. That's a that's a that's a very good question. I don't have an answer for this yet. <laughs> <laughs> so 
before this year. For you to think for future. <laughs> but basically, basically, yes. You know, I think this is a small fund. You know, the 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 the, the volume on invested money is. As it is planned now, it is relatively small in terms of like investment uh, funds and work. So I think uh, pretty much anybody can uh, can be part of it. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a limit. I don't have a limit at the moment. I don't have. A, and uh, to be honest, I still have to think a little bit about it. Uh, I'm still. This 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 project is is rather happening. Uh, uh, we're establishing the, the the company. We just started buying uh, the, the the land, uh, so uh, I don't have any I don't have a particular idea at the moment uh, what should be the limits uh, in terms of the size of the investment. But I think it's pretty much could be anybody. I, I have a, a thought. I don't know if it's yet yet a question, <laughs> but. Um, I don't know much about this, but in Spain, for example, it's very common that politicians sometimes uh, change the denomination of some land or some plot to increase the value. So, for example, if it's just a field somewhere, it has very little value, but all of a sudden, if, we, if you transform it and change the law so that you can build stuff there, then it gets much more value, uh, potential value. I think, of course, this this will make the fund, uh, in your case, increase in value and be more. Um... No, don't worry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so I know, my, my you know what you're trying to say. You know, I, you know this, 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 this is this is a purely uh, uh, environmental thing. You know, so so don't don't be afraid that uh, there's some speculation behind it. You know, it's of course. Uh, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be talking to you. Exactly. No, no, I, I'm pretty sure. And I, I really appreciate that you do this and put your own resources into something so effective. But my, my real question is, how do you prevent, if you if you accept investors, how, how do you set their rules? How do you prevent? You, I, 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 I would keep a full control of it. Uh, you have uh, different type of stocks and you can you can keep a full control of the fund. You know that's a, that's a principle of an investment fund. You know there's a there's a founder. There is a you can you can emit uh, you can emit bonds or or stocks, but you still have a full control of the project. You know. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how much. And in terms of bonds, I would like I would like to this fund to 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 function properly. You know, I I'm 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 putting together like uh, this investment committee. But that should be based. Uh, there should be ecologists, you know, and, and experts, you know, and uh, so this is this is this is more. Uh, no, no, it's this is. Uh, I I I understand uh, your concerns, but uh, this is definitely not the issue. I'm not concerned. Just a lot of curiosity. How <laughs> you can maintain it? No, I imagine if it was a, a company, then you get several stakeholders, and then they take over the company with. Right, right. No, no, no. This is this is, <laughs> and but but that the 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 fund structure, you know, and the, this this fund is uh, is being licensed with the Czech National Bank. It has a very strict and regulated uh, 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 rules or structure, and uh, no, you you you. I would I would keep the full control of of the of the fund. Excellent, thank you. Sure. And I think we have another question. Uh, hello. Uh, I have actually two questions from me. So one thing is, I mean, did you did you think about to put some legislation protection on the places because this makes it for the investor, potential investor, more like stable, you know, because once it, it is protected by the state somehow, it shows that it has some clear aim. But on the other hand, our legislation and Conservation is very rigid, so it makes it on the other hand very complicated if you want to do something with it in some modern way, you know, management or whatever, because in our legislation, if you are late, the conservation is very conserving. <laughs> right, right. right. Put it into the end. And the second is, uh, which is quite used, is the, to use it for the potential tourism. But this is less, again, Another side of, of the coin, which too much tourism is very distracting to such places. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I'm, I'm uh, totally, uh, definitely, I'm considering uh, the legislation uh, protection. Uh, mm -hmm. At the moment, I think we are, 
uh, and I also understand, you know, if if I if I reach some legislation uh, protection like uh, EVL or um, I'm not sure about the English terms, it can complicate, uh, it can quite complicate the whole thing, you know, if we're talking now about maybe some, uh, we try to re revitalize maybe some parts of the land in, uh, in Marij, because there is there is there are some problems on the land you know it's uh, the eutrophication you know it's uh, it's the chemicals coming from uh, from the drainage and from the fields around and so on so uh yeah i'm i'm, I'm just learning th those issues and i'm talking to uh i think very relevant people in uh in uh odbor životního prostředí you know and i'm and i'm talking pretty much to everybody and they say like wait with this you know like do do what you need to do but for the future you know i think for the fund you know it's uh, so i can i can um, i can keep uh, the the idea or the the uh, you know what's the english for uh yeah uh, this this mission of the, of the fund you know i i would uh, i would uh, uh, try to get the legislation protection for those lands you know some 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 kind of uh, protection or uh, the, the 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 nature uh, conservation uh, also the tourism and uh, and uh, agriculture or eco farming it's a it's a it's a it's a tough 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 thing you know on one hand uh, if uh, the portfolio becomes bigger or we try to consolidate you know uh, the land in Marish and it's there, there is a good chance that the, that we will double or triple the, the size of the land and we will buy some uh, some fields uh, uh, in, in, in around this around this plot you know then we have to deal with some to make the project sustainable we have to deal with some eco farming otherwise it's not sustainable it's impossible so uh, eco farming and but we i think we're very interested it's it's a big challenge i know nothing about uh, eco farming but again you know i'm already uh, meeting people who are good in it so uh, and and tourism yeah i'm actually in particular about tourism, I would be very careful, and I, uh, I, and I'm, I'm afraid of tourism because uh, those habitats uh, are so nice and so uh, has uh, this great biodiversity mainly because of no, uh, no traffic, no human traffic. So uh, yeah, I would be very, very, very careful about the touristic function. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> uh, hi, I'd like to ask what's uh, your plan according to the size uh, in future? You would like to have thousands of hectares or what? How, how do you think this can work? Because in small scale we have some some people trying, but uh, I think we don't have fun like it. It would be really funded by investors and the potential is very high. So what is your plan? Everything goes well. Uh, I I have no idea to be honest. Uh, uh, I, as, as I said at the moment, you know, based on my uh, private resources, I am I should be able to invest ten million crowns a year. Uh, so uh, this would reflect the size I think today. Mm -hmm. You're buying, you're buying wetlands and meadows, and uh, or I mean the agriculture. Uh, it's it's the 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 price ranging from uh, from uh, thirty to let's say fifty, maybe sixty crowns per uh, per meter. So we can uh, there's an easy easy uh, calculation behind it. So uh, th 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 this is this is this is the this is the growth that. Uh, that is based. Uh, that is based. Is expected. Uh, expected on my private resources. The question is, if I what invest investors I would attract, uh, how much money they would like to invest, that can make the, the the fund growing faster. Also, it's about the habitats. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, I already um, talked to few people that helped me to to identify uh, those habitats you know at the moment with this 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 plot in Matish, i was only lucky you know i i love this area i spent a lot of time there i was lucky finding this spot uh, this, this place that was for sale uh, the one in uh, karlovy region i think uh, i i got uh, tip from uh, Radka Musilova from from Zamene some time ago and I was just lucky that 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 uh, that I was able to buy it 
but um, at the same time, so the, the, the growth and the, the size of the fund uh, depends on the financial resources, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the investors, and also about on uh, the, the, the plots or the sites that, can, uh, that would create uh, the portfolio. I can hardly move the tree region. <laughs> <laughs> there are many nice areas in the tree Krai, so I'm 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 happy. I'm happy if you if you if you if you help me. I'm I'm I'm, I'm interested in some good advice. Okay. Excellent thing. So I know Kretka, do you have another one? Yeah, I had a question which was almost like uh, answered, yeah. How do you want to look for the for the Places maybe I mean the Czech Republic is small and, and all zoologists know each other, so maybe it's possible somehow to create some some wish list of all the different uh, interesting places in Czech Republic which need such protection. Yeah, so so I've, creative like yeah. I've. I for, example, think... for example, we were working in some project on the area which was which is now managed by pasturing, mm -hmm. and we improved the meadows, let's say, and there were a lot of local people under it with the land, and they they would be probably interested to sell it to, to people who would keep the way, you know, because this is some traditional historical way of managing the pastures, so. Mm -hmm. If such investors exist, I mean, it's it's an option. Uh, yes, I think uh, that's that's uh, part of part of my mission. It's part of my mission to uh, to promote this fund and uh, to uh, to uh, motivate people to uh, maybe bring uh, more investment possibilities. It's brilliant. It's a great idea. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you get more questions, we will convey them to you. <laughs> Please do. Okay, thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. And so we think we can make a break. It's time for time coffee, for coffee, please. <laughs> 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 um, we can when it's in 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we are a bit late in the schedule, but yeah. Yeah. We can push it, no? <laughs> 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 okay, so Okay. Okay. So you
La he visto, he dicho, no se lo digo. Nadie se va a ver. Pero no se va a ver. No, no, no. Why just follow? Why some contact, no? Where you go first? Congo, Indonesia. Also, also. Oh, this guy, eh? This, like, I'm using my list of my personal bands. 10 million. It's fantastic. But 
So you go to Sumatra. <laughs> it's, it's cool, no? <laughs> it will be so nice. And I think she will be up for going anyway. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> One second. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sorry, okay, okay. Sí. Cerebro. Es imperativo. Pero vamos a hacerla ya. No, no, no. Pero Sí. Thank <laughs> you. 
No, no, si es que en el caso de la Ah, bueno, me cerca. Claro, si es que acaso. Y se pone delante del texto. Si sí, sube yo aquí el tanta. Si 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 sube Si sube yo aquí el tanta. Si sube pero la pero no no pongas la llamada eso eso Mm -hmm. 
Perfect. I think I'm live. <laughs> you watch me. Would you honor me presenting like myself? When I no. <laughs> <laughs> and can you stop sharing? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. No. Hello, everyone. We are back online. And um, it is my pleasure <laughs> to introduce my very good friend, Alberto Parada. Thank you. <laughs> who has been brave enough to come all the way to the Czech Republic to, to give a talk at this conference. And he's here in representation of, well, a lot of <laughs> important yes. uh, Alberto, Alberto is, a, is a freelance biologist uh, with many different projects. And today he's going to talk about one that he's doing in collaboration with the, the La Rioja government in mm -hmm. Spain. And, uh, and it will be about the pollinators, pollinators <laughs> and their relationship with humans. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Nana. All right, so yeah, uh, let me uh, share a screen so I can start. Yes, perfect. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nando, and thank you, Alka Wildlife, for, for bringing me <laughs> for bringing me here in, to Czech Republic in this adventure. <laughs> so it's uh, an honor for me uh, to be part of this this uh, congress and this um, uh, talks, because. Um, other projects that, that have been presented have been amazed. So I've been amazed with them. So it, it's uh, uh, I'm so very glad for for being here. And yes, I I'm going to, to talk to you about uh, uh, one of the projects. I think one of, one of the coolest projects I'm uh, involved in, uh, which is organized by the government of La Rioja, which is a region in the northern Spain. And I am collaborating as part of the work team uh, nowadays in it. So it will be about pollinators. Uh, and, and, but after, uh, before I say anything, let me introduce where, what is the, the project. So Nando, could you turn now? Or not? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, so. We are working on a northern region in Spain, which is called La Rioja. You maybe know it because of the wines, of the famous wines, but not, uh, I think, with good wines, but not as good as, as the ones that are here in, in the Czech Republic, or so so, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we are uh, working on just a part of the region, uh, which is inside uh, a man of uh, man and biosphere program of the UNESCO. Uh, so it's the, the great part of this map is here uh, in the, you see the, the arrow? Okay, so is this, this is a region and this gray uh, part of the map, which is this one, is the, the southeastern uh, part of the mountain ranges there in the, in the region. Um, which is about 120,000 hectares, which is a lot, in, at least proportionally with the, with the size of the region. It's almost uh, the, the fourth of the region, of the whole region. And it's called Biosphere Reserve, Valles de la Lama, Cubera, Tiragos, and Alama, which is valleys of the Leza, Leza Cubera, Tiragos, and Alama rivers. So are the rivers that are right there. Uh, yeah, so the project is, is working on there. 
as I said, because of this program, which is it's uh, the, the, the this biosphere reserve is inside the, the man and biosphere program, which is a, a program inside the UNESCO. It's, it's worldwide, and the main the main aim of this program is, as you may know, is to establish. Uh, yeah, this is literally what they say. This is to establish a, a scientific basis to connect people with their environment or so with their uh, line, landscape. So um, I think the best, mm, uh, with the best uh, way to explain it is with this meme. Uh, so it's, it's about all of these projects. It's about connecting people because that, that, that region is a low density population region and, and it's um, inside all the de la rioja it's one of the um, lowest um, population uh, parts so so yeah we wanted to to carry on a, a project not only for wildlife but also for for people living in the place so the main the main aim always will be to connect both places on both sides uh throughout through the science so this is the the name of the project it's called objetivo pollinizadores it's like a, a play a, a, a work was play with objetivo which means in english uh, in spanish it has two meanings more but but we, we want to play with two meanings with one is the uh, Objective as a target, as our mission, our mission are pollinators in this project. And uh, it also means the, the lens, the lens of a camera. So it, because they are on the on the lens of, the, of uh, our camera or our, uh, or our eyes. Uh, um, and this is the, the logo of, of all the of this, re, this biosphere research. So we, as part of Man and Biosphere program, we wanted to, to continue this, this same and, and connect people with their environments throughout science and in, 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 in this case, throughout the, the local fauna and these pollinators. So we'll have, I think, the, the standard path in any conservation project, which is uh, we, this has uh, three mainstays, which are first of all research. We are going to to we are planning um, some some mainstays of this project because it's in the very beginning of, of its development. So we we are now in a in a in a stage of designing all the work. So then the government will take it out and, and decide whether it continues or not or, or what to do or, or anything. So uh, we are defining some main, some mainstays, as I said, it's a, first of all is research. Um, the other one uh, we think it's, it's important is outreach because it's not, it has no sense just to work with fauna and forgetting people. So, we, we want to, to show it, to show all the work or to show all the, the research uh, it's going to be due to, to all the people locally, but then uh, we always want to, to say it abroad, abroad the region, abroad the Spain, whatever. I'll, I'll talk about it later. And the, the last one is conservation. So, uh, we want to, to to develop or at least to design uh, conservation access, which are the, the main point in these lectures. So uh, I said it was at the very beginning, so we're working on it uh, just for just this year. So it's, it's in the very, very first stages. So, but we have already done some, some, I think, some cool work. At least I, I consider it because uh, I like it a lot. So, first of all, we have uh, been, uh, we have done a, a study of the current status of the Asian hornet. 
because as you know, it's uh, an invasive species in the southwestern part of, of Europe. And in Spain, we have been a lot of problems with this, with this invasive species. And from, uh, from time to time in La Rioja, it's, it's been, it's, it's now actually, it's, uh, it's been in, a, in the process of colonizing of the region. But because of the, let me show you the map, because of, of the weather of this part of the region, it, the colonization of this hornet is in a little bit slower than in other parts. So that's like, oof, it's a, a first breath for us, but we have to be uh, uh, aware. So we are uh, studying exactly where, it, uh, where, the, all the observations or the, or the spots, it's been um, spot. So, um, other kind of activities that we've done is, is to connect uh, or to, to speak local people about the project itself and also about pollinators as, as a, a big group of animals. So, we've been done um, a couple of activities we, uh, there in the region within the, the biosphere reserve. And they have been, uh, I think, because um, considering the, the amount of people has come, that have come, I think it was a, a success. It was great. People enjoyed it a lot. And this is how we, uh, <laughs> how we made it. We, we sell it. <laughs> As, as a great familiar activity, it's like, oh, we are going to, to build a back uh, hotel, so bring your kids here and come with your family, we'll enjoy it, it will be great, so we'll be spending a, a great morning uh, just for fun, don't worry, don't, it won't be some scientific uh, boring stuff and, and so on. So people say, okay, oh, great. Oh, such a nice thing. Uh, but no, no, sorry, sorry, but no. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> since they were already there, we said, okay. Mm, <laughs> it, it wasn't about the, the Bats Hotel. <laughs> this is, this is about pollinator. So uh, let me talk to you a, a little bit about this topic. So, so we, um, we talked about pollinators, about uh, honeybees, about uh, beehives, a lot of, a lot of, we, we made a lot of uh, different outreach activities. So people were awareness about the, the, this, or, or, or they were concerned about the, the pollinators problem. Um, but then I think it, it was such a good, uh, about, well, at least numbers uh, <laughs> reinforce the, this, 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 this thing I've already said. Because one of the, I, I, this is the, the success case, okay? Uh, one of the activities where it, was in a, in a village, in a very low density village with uh, eight people uh, <laughs> uh, neighborhood. So to the total population of the village was eight people. So we made the, the activity there and we, we managed to bring them uh, 80 people. So it's like we raised like 10 times the, the population of the, of the village. So we consider it a great success, which is amazing. And, and they, they not only played or, played or built the, the Bugs uh, Hotel, but they were told a lot of things and, and conservation messages about pollinators and, and local relationship about people and, and wild fauna, not, but not only about wild fauna, but also livestock and, and of course, honeybees, for instance, as you know, it is our uh, life, uh, livestock. So then, uh, other, another, another action that we 
taken is to jump into, into the modernity with uh, social media. So one, one thing we, we can say, uh, as this is my own experience as Alberto Parada, as my, because I have outreach uh, social medias, uh, environmental education and, and same conservation education, you can say. And I've, uh, throughout the years, I've checked the, the power of, of the social media as a conservation tool. And this is just one of the, uh, the videos I have on YouTube, for instance, which is about uh, uh, awareness of the snakes. And yeah, the numbers are like well, amazing. Compared with other I don't know, gaming or music or so on, it of course are low, but but at least for instance in this in this case, it's like two hundred more than two hundred thousand people have seen this and, and a lot of liked it as well. So it's like a huge uh, speaker. So with social media, I think it's a it's a tool, it's not the the, the finish line, but it's just the, the another tool we can use. Uh, and we can implement it in, in a lot of projects. So uh, considering this, we thought that it would be a great option to make social media for this project. So we created um, profiles in Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. And yeah, so, so we can expand not only for local people, but also, let's say, abroad the region or abroad Spain or, or whatever, uh, the whole project. So we we create awareness about pollinators as a, a, the whole group, but also about this this project we have. And um, one of the most uh, time-consuming <laughs> part of the project uh, has been this one. So we've been designing the, the future actions uh, to, to give them to the local government, government so they can uh, choose whether to um, do them or not. Um, and we've been We've been thinking about what kind of conservation actions we could uh, carry on. So this is our proposal. So this, this, these are our um, points. We think they, they would uh, work well. Since the important relationship between pollinators and, and flowers, we think one of the most important uh, one of the most important actions we can or the project can um, carry on is to create or to build uh, pollinator gardens since they with with obviously with native plants and native flowers and um, and there are a lot of places where they can be built for instance uh, we propose to speak with local companies like uh, farming, for instance, uh, because the, the all the region is, or most part of the region is um, is farmed. So there are fruits, uh, or vegetables, or uh, something like that. So there are not many, but, but some uh, companies that, that run uh, their business there. So they could spend a little percentage of their uh, lands to to build these kind of, of gardens, promoting uh, local species, local plant species. Then we propose to to speak with councils and city halls and all kinds of uh, administration people, say, so they can um, they can make some something like that uh, as well like like companies so they can uh, spend part of the lands or part of the, the territory to build a pollinator garden so so we can um, raise the bio the plant biodiversity so it, it will uh, it will be a, a, such a good thing for raising the pollinators uh, biodiversity as well and one of the the main things are as well, and it's been told in, in past lectures, 
is to keep boundary sets uh, between uh, croplands and so on uh, alive. So, so um, the, we propose to keep those that are already <laughs> alive and to make uh, decisions or make actions in order to, to raise the, the, to increase the, um, the number of uh, living ages. So, so we can as well plant um, native species of, of plants and flowers so they can attract uh, pollinators and increase the, the biodiversity of the, of the place. And then one of the, yeah, I think uh, an important thing as well is if we propose to talk with farmers, with local people, of, uh, of course, but also with agrarian syndicates and so on, so they can magnify the, the kind of actions. So uh, not only we don't only propose the, the project itself of people working in, uh, on the project itself to carry on all of these actions, but also we want to magnify it. So we can so we, so we are proposing to to make uh, talks or or lectures with with this kind of, of people. Uh, at the end, one of the things that, um, at the meantime, we were designing all of these actions and, and so on, we, we thought about this, this uh, problem, the, the problem of, of the exploitation of beekeeping, because since, since beekeeping is, is uh, livestock, uh, Work. It's uh, bees are or honey bees are uh, cattle. Um, we we better. We, I think we we can better imagine it with uh, with big animals uh, example. So we can we can imagine or, uh, the we can figure out the the problem of over exploitation with I don't know cows or or sheep. If a, a region is overexploited by big animals, you know what what the problems on biodiversity are, and this also uh, happens with, with small farm and, and with small animals like bees being as well cattle. So we propose to to develop a study of, of yeah to quantify first of all because it hasn't been anything done uh, since uh, since today and um, we propose to to carry on this the, to carry out this um, this kind of study to, to first of all to take like a, a, an actual photo and then to to see or, or to consider it whether there must be uh, taken uh, uh, some actions or not. Uh, well, this is the main, uh, I, th I think, um, stakeholders of the, the project. I think the main state actually, of the project. Um, we, uh, before I, I finish, I would, like, I would like to say thank, thank you again to, to Alca Wildlife for, for Organizing this and the, the government of La Rioja, uh, who is organizing this project, and the Rioja Biosphere Reserve, which is the all the region in which the project is being uh, developed. Um, it, we, it, it would be great if we, you follow us in our social media, but they are in Spanish. So. But at least the photos are, are good, I think. <laughs> so we are going to to use them to, to to share information about the project itself, but also to make some outreach about the, the pollinators as well. So thank you, this was all. <laughs> and I think we can make some questions. <laughs> okay. So Alberto, you spoke about some potential for exploitation uh -huh. of the uh, mm -hmm. And mean like mean over exploitation of 
landscape, uh-huh. I have so many types, so the natural pollinators uh-huh. that don't move. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, because of competition. But but the main point is that we don't know how is the how is it actually. So the we want to to first of all take a photo. Yes, it's, what is how how is it today nowadays? And then consider whether it's been a problem or whether it, it, it could be just uh, it's okay. It's, there is a no there is no problem. But I think we think it could it it's needed to to make some research in that uh, in that point. Hmm. Yeah, what is your Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for now. Now, what are methods? How do you do? That, uh, we are working on that. <laughs> we are working. Yes, as I say, it's at the very beginning of the project. So we, first of all, the government asked us the, uh, to make a, a plan or a global plan, and then they they have to decide. First of all, they have to decide whether they like it or not. Or whether or which part of the project are okay for them and which not. So then, after they say yes or not or this yet or this not, we we or, or people working on it will develop the, the methods. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I mean, can you tell us a bit more how how many you have there and how how it works at all because. We have some system in Czech Republic which is really, I mean, you should be usually I mean, a member of some club, so they try to overdo how many beehives in the landscape are and where they are. Uh-huh. We don't have the numbers, the, the precise numbers yet, at least. That's one of the parts of that we would uh, that we would uh, work on. But yeah, the place, the region, especially the the biosphere reserve, is rich on on beehives. One of the main, I don't know if the, the main, not not the main the main one, but one of the most um, extended uh, works in there is is uh, honey keeping. So uh, bee keeping. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a, it's so important that we think it. It should be made some research precisely on that. Mm-hmm. So there is no some statistic or anything? Yeah, 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 they are. They are there. But we haven't uh, taken them precisely, at least at, at this moment of the project. But it should be one of the important uh, pillars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, do you know how is it like, uh, the development? In- uh, for example, in Czech Republic, there are some less big keepers, and then you know, they want to push to engage. Ah, yeah, it's it's um it's a thing like that. Yes. Ah, let me see. Mm-hmm. So we can see. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 as well the problem. Yeah, it's like I think all livestock farmers or livestock yeah. workers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yes. I would like to ask you uh, uh-huh. when promoting the uh, flowering gardens uh-huh. or meadows, also, uh, do you somehow focus on the you know uh, the mixture of the seeds of the plants? Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, from the point of view of the real locality. Because I come across the term of like, mechanization of the landscape. It means that everyone wants to have yes. some meadows, but they yes. don't care if this uh, even check the flower is native or say, local in the uh, yeah. mm-hmm. location. Yes, yes, of course. Of course, of course. It's so important at uh, that uh, point. Yes, yes. It's it won't <laughs> I think it will be some optimal <laughs> work <laughs> because I, I don't know how precisely um, could it be at least to run all the project. So, so the the um, our wish is that that to to be uh, the more precise, even locally uh, with the selection of of seeds, of course. But but yeah, as I said. 
the aim, the, the, the global aim is not to, to is not that this work is uh, will be done um, by the teamwork, but we want to, to, in, to involve local people. So we want to, at, the, at the first stages that work will be of course, done by the project, but but that uh, we think it's important to to have those talks I about. I talk about with local people to involve them so they can be um, so they can be aware of, of which seeds are good or, or which seeds shouldn't be planted like basic species or, or non-native species. Uh, so it would um, yeah, run throughout the time without the, the the, the I think the, the most utopic scenario is that the project runs itself without our help as, mm -hmm. as any conservation plan. So we are uh, uh, making emphasizing that point. At least when I when we talk with the government and we say oh, you should do this this way because it should be better, but we would do this way. But at least the decision is not on our hands. The last at least. Yes. I have just a comment. I mean, I, I know that the Czech Republic did some commercial uh -huh. seeds packages yes. and for the uh, blooming gardens, and they are really bad for the nature because there are quite some yeah. Non original. Yeah, I think well. it's, it's a trade off because pollinators are getting famous in, in society, let's say, globally. So that is like a trend, and when wildlife becomes a trend, it's like oof, 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 like a. But I think it's not bad or good by definition, but it's like a, a trade-off. <laughs> it's like okay, people is is getting awareness about this problem, so they want to to do nice things like this one, like buying seeds to to plant them for pollinators. But it's important that they are uh, they. They know which which seeds or which which kind of actions are good or, or could be even worse if they carry them out. Yes. Huh? Yes. I think maybe it's better way. It's probably a lot longer and difficult, but to get to the flowering where seeds not like bites and putting them there, but like management. No, I mean, because yes. The management. The seeds aren't in the, in the kitchen. So, Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, mm, the, 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 the seed plant is not the only action. Of course, it's one of them, but we propose to, to make actions to keep uh, edges or borders uh, between the, the local farms or, or when, uh, whatever. But if, if they are well keep mm, in a natural process it will be uh, recognized by by native plants so of course yeah, it's a mixture of, of both of both actions yes. one, more one more okay <laughs> <laughs> there are new farmers who uh -huh. tell them uh, to do this nice uh, mm -hmm. Can you offer them something, or how do you want to engage them to do it? Or yeah, yeah. I think the the previous work should be not to to tell them you have to plant this because it's good. Believe me, I know what I say. But um, but to, to to make some work, some previous work, just uh, creating some awareness or preventing them, talking them about the, the benefits of pollinators. Since I think with this group or with this system of the group of animals, it's easier than other groups since at least I think it's almost 75% of, of vegetables used by us, by the people for our food, almost 75 is pollinated by animals. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, you want to make more money? So keep, keep bumble this or keep uh, 
yeah, reptiles that pollinate or so on. So it, but first stages should be in that direction. First, making them um, understand the important the importance or, of this group of animals or, and the relationship between plants and, and pollinators, <coughs> and then in a, on a second stage or, a, or whatever, to, to give them the tools and say, okay, those are, or these are the good actions to, to be carried out. <laughs> but not, okay, plant this, because this, because it could be in the other direction. It could be, because uh, they can, they could be defensive, because it is, it's like you, you don't know more than me. I've been working yeah. here all my life. You come from the city. You don't tell me oh, how I should work. So yes. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. So thank you for all. Hope you enjoy the. back here again <laughs> from the other camera <laughs> great so we can present the next ideas uh, the the next talk it's, you, have, you haven't sent oh, again tell me <laughs> you have to send me the last email you sent to her or she sent to you uh, or yes okay don't worry with this technical stuff. So the next lecture is about snakes. So um, and it will be uh, carried out by Raka Musilova from Chamenis. And, and the title of the of the lecture is Action Plan for the Esculapian Snake, Chamenis Longissimus, in the Eger River Valley. Uh, we have here Rata. <laughs> so our technical crew is <laughs> making it possible. <laughs> we are getting there. We are getting there. Yes, we are in the same course. room, but for YouTube to see, it, we have to send each other emails <laughs> all around. So now you should be in the It's not easy to, to organize an international conference. All right. So, thank you. Uh -huh. so this will be the last uh, talk before having lunch. <laughs> so after the talk, we ha will have a, a, a lunch break. <laughs>
Ah, and then, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I have to say that the, after the lunch break, we'll have an excursion here in, in, in the place the, the conference is taking place. So we, the lectures will uh, return at four o'clock this afternoon, at four o'clock, it is the general session. So we, we, we are coming at, at four o'clock after lunch break. Perfect. We will have a couple of, of lectures at, at four o'clock. Perfect. Okay. So mm -hmm. then this afternoon we'll have a couple of, of lectures and we'll finish about 5.30. Ah, no, six, 6.30, because then we have a plenary discussion. Oh, ah, this afternoon is the, the discussion. Yeah. Let's hope, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> let's hope we can get there. But I think if anything, we can cut the discussion short if needed. Mm -hmm. One thing we were just thinking about, and I think we talked about it earlier yesterday, mm -hmm is that maybe for our plenary discussion we could invite people already mm -hmm. and anyone interested can contact with us and, contact and anyway and like sending an email in. to alka or, yeah. or to me or in social media tell us and then we will share with every, everyone interested we will share a zoom link and we can be all in the discussion like we have been doing here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have several topics to talk about yeah if which are the main topics for the <laughs> discussion i like it I like the selection of topics <laughs> of this plenary discussion. I mean, originally our idea was to focus on outreach and engagement, uh -huh. but uh, we have had so many good presenters yes. and nice, interesting talks. Yes. So I think inviting them and if any yeah. of them can come, we can talk about conservation in Africa or how to go to Indonesia. <laughs> how to go to Indonesia, yeah. yeah. We can talk about pollinators. Maybe we can think <clears throat> depending on who's coming mm -hmm. what, what to talk about i think that's a good idea yes yeah and, and i had this this original wish that that as engagement is it's one of the main pieces in every conservation project almost every conservation project that wants to involve people mm -hmm. uh, one good topic was the our original one uh let's admit which is, I don't know, talk about our experience with engagement and yeah, all of this using social media <laughs> and what what are the hardships, with technology being one of them. Yes, yes, yes. Well, yes. <laughs> this is hard. <laughs> okay. We are yeah. almost there. Yes. Dear, dear presenters, dear audience. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. Perfect. We have our technical <laughs> committee. <laughs> there. Sure. No, no. Okay. No, no. No, porque su hueso está. Ya está. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, here we have Hello. Hello to everybody. <laughs> Uh, so, thank you. All yours, yes. Thank you for invitation to this conference. Uh, my name is uh, Radka Vuselova and I'm from uh, NGO Zamenis. And as you, uh, you can see, the Zamenis is the name uh, of the snake. Uh, it's the rarest snake uh, in the Czech Republic. Its name is Esculapian snake. Uh, and today uh, I would like to share some information uh, from the action plan. Uh, that uh, is realized uh, in the northwest Bohemia. Uh, it's a place um, along the river, the one of the major river in the Czech Republic. Its name is uh, Ohře in Czech and uh, Eger in the English. So this will be about the snake living uh, in this uh, locality. Uh, 
the Esculapian snake is a quite <coughs> unique snake species. Uh, and uh, almost in all, all languages, uh, you can uh, feel the like uh, connection to the god of medicine, uh, Asclepius. Uh, and almost in uh, all languages, uh, it's uh, already in the in its name. It's Esculapian snake in English, Asclepnatra in Germany, Esculapopolos in Russia, Culevra uh, uh, Desclop in France, and Colubro de Esculapio in Italy. But in Czech, uh, the name is only like three snakes, so the only name that is not uh, involved the uh, Esculapian. But it used to be a uh, Esculapian snake as well. And today, uh, you can see this uh, snake. Uh, it's a symbol of pharmacy, uh, of the doctors, and so on. Uh, and uh, the other, I think, quite important thing is that uh, it's quite a big snake. It can reach. Uh, almost two meters, but uh, in our locality, the, the longest snake that you can see here at the picture, uh, it has, uh, I would say, only 100, uh, one meter and 70 centimeters. Uh, and uh, it can be, for the local people, it can be uh, easily distinguishable from all other snake species because of its size uh, and also the color because the, um, like, uh, the snake has brown you know, the, uh, the, the side and uh, the, uh, the ventral side is yellow. So the back, the back is brown and the belly is yellow. So it's quite easily for the local people to, uh, to see that this is the, not the venomous one. But uh, at our locality, uh, the snake has been uh, unnoticed to the, by the scientific community until uh, 1880. And uh, there is the first notice in literature that the snake is uh, living uh, in this valley. It was a long time ago. And it was uh, quite, I think, uh, strange for the people because uh, here, as you can see in the map, uh, the, the our locality is marked by a uh, blue point. And uh, as you can see, it's maybe 200 kilometers far, far from uh, other localities. So uh, the first hypothesis, uh, the first question was how the snake could live such a far from the, uh, I would say, current distribution. And uh, one of uh, the first uh, answers was that it might have been introduced by the question is when, why, and who put uh, on it in the history to, uh, to introduce snakes. But uh, there were some hypotheses. Uh, the, the oldest one is that uh, snake was introduced by ancient Romans, uh, then later by some noble families from Italy or France, or even later by some Greek merchant. Uh, but uh, today it is considered to be a relic of wider uh, distribution that was uh, about several thousand years ago. And you can see that there is not only our population, but there are also a uh, few more uh, populations that are isolated above the northern uh, edge. And this, uh, this fact can be supported uh, in two ways, I would say. The first one is that we have fossil records. Uh, it's quite clear evidence that the snake used to be distributed, used to live uh, even in the northern part of Germany, uh, Denmark, and in Poland. Uh, and then there is a second way how to prove it, uh, that uh, based on some genetic research that was done maybe uh, 10 years ago, and it was part of my uh, PhD study. Uh, uh, we did some analysis uh, in Europe, and we, uh, it was revealed that there are two clades in Europe, and also one uh, in Asia. And as you can see, the Arab population belongs to the eastern one, uh, together with uh, all the other isolated populations. So we can exclude the introduction theory from France or uh, Italy based on this uh, study. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can feel that the situation of isolated population is not easy because uh, it's like more uh, thermophil species and it's uh, distributed mainly in the southern part of the Europe. But there are some uh, isolated populations 
about the northern damage scattered around the Europe, and some of them are already black. It means uh, they uh, are extinct, uh, but uh, some of them still survive uh, until today. But it's not uh, easy for them because uh, the climate conditions are not very suitable and it depends on the year. So there are, uh, there are some fluctuations in population size that are typical uh, for, for the locality. So uh, we started in uh, 2005 by a systematic snake study. Uh, and at this time, uh, we revealed that there, is, there might be around several hundred snakes, let's say from 400 to 600. Uh, it's not a critical value for the snake, but still it's not enough to, to be perspective population. Uh, and also there is uh, other problem that the area of the snake is quite limited. It's only uh, 12 square kilometers. And uh, then uh, it's quite uh, sure that uh, there are some key places for the snakes because uh, of their annual cycle. Uh, they uh, need some places for, for reproduction, for hibernation. And uh, also uh, there is one uh, interesting interesting things about the snake that uh, the snake is um, quite uh, a strong association to man-made structure. And uh, also we reviewed some weakening factors and uh, we can show that reproduction success is not very um, high. There are some years that maybe less than 50% of eggs uh, can be successfully hatched. Uh, now have a look uh, where the snake is living. As you can uh, see from the map, it's mainly along the main river. Uh, also, there are, there are the villages along the main river. And uh, then the snakes spread a little bit to the grasslands or, or along the side streams. But still, uh, the whole area is uh, quite small. Uh, and I would like to mention here that probably somewhere uh, somewhere here, there is a small settlement with the name uh, Osveno. And uh, we will mention it later. That there is some something like Snake Center today. Uh, we started with some uh, population uh, size of study. Uh, and uh, it's not because we are studying the snakes maybe for 20 years now, but uh, we are not, uh, it's not a continuous. Uh, we do some like short term studies based on uh, focused on population size. So one study uh, was from 2005 to 2006, and then uh, 10 years later, we did the same just to compare uh, how the population size changed. Uh, and we uh, revealed some, um, I think, good information. Uh, here you can see our famous snake because um, the, the, the study is based on marking and recapturing uh, snakes. And um, this snake, uh, we were able to catch him maybe 10 times, but uh, this was not the reason why he's famous, but uh, we were able to catch him like 10, 10 years later. Uh, you can see 2015. Uh, and um, at the time, after 10 years, well, the marking uh, is uh, uh, not recognizable anymore. But uh, if you make photos of head, uh, you can, uh, there are some specific, I would say, scales or anomalies. So you can, you can determine the, the specific individual based on the, on the, the photo. So we have huge, uh, up to now, we have huge collection of photos. And it was not only this one snake, we uh, later discovered that we know at least maybe 20 snakes from the previous study. So it can be sure that snakes can survive a long time in, in this locality. And it's not uh, exception that they are maybe, uh, more than uh, 20 years old. And these snakes give us a lot of information about uh, the life and the secret life of the snakes, how they uh, grew. And, uh, how they live and so on. So if we compare the uh, two population size studies, we can see that in the, uh, during the first study, 
we assess that there is maybe 500 snakes and 10 years later it was 600 snakes so it might seem it might seem to not to be such a huge progress uh, but we think that it's a step into the right direction uh, at least 100 uh, more snakes um, and there is some other positive aspects uh, that um, the proportion of young animals is growing, you can see from 14% to almost 20. And it's always good to have a lot of young animals. It's like uh, evidence of the, the population is growing. And uh, what are the main threats for, uh, for this isolated population? In the first place, it's of course the isolation itself because it's uh, more than 200 kilometers to uh, some other population, so uh, anything that happened to the population, uh, to the population, it can be supplemented by some other animals because 200 kilometers is too far for snake to move. And also there are some, some other problems. Uh, it was already mentioned, the landscape changes, especially in the second half of the 20th century, uh, some traffic problems, some uh, of, and because it's a snake, there's still a lot of people they don't like snakes, so there might be problem with the direct persecution. And uh, in the recent period, it's also uh, pets and uh, non-native predators because the snakes are usually living in the vicinity of human settlements, so they are dogs, cats, and uh, also the non-native predators like, for example, a raccoon. So uh, I think that uh, you have seen uh, these pictures like uh, in several more presentations uh, th these days, but uh, this is from the center of the locality. It's the village with the name uh, Strash, not Ozi. And you can compare the picture from 1938 uh, uh, and in present. And uh, we, uh, we should mention that it's not the locality where the, the the changes were so radical. It's still quite a nice place to live, even for uh, people and snakes. But uh, even there, there are, uh, there are some, some changes. Uh, there has been a reduction uh, in the landscape mosaic. Uh, there is much more uh, forest than it used to be. And uh, what is the worst for uh, reptiles? Uh, that these changes led to disappearance of uh, the scattered man-made structures like uh, roads, uh, like uh, some uh, dry stone walls and all the places that can be, these places are, are quite crucial for the uh, snake population. So uh, because the situation is, is not very good, uh, the action plan uh, was approved in 2008. And uh, there are several measures I uh, think <coughs> realizing just now. Uh, the, the most important thing uh, to how to help uh, to the snake population is uh, building a clinging sites because the reproduction uh, is not always successful uh, in this climate. So uh, we, uh, it's like the main activities. Uh, then uh, there is some habitat management, like uh, reptiles like the open areas. So where there is a succession and a brush, you can, or bush, you can uh, clean it uh, every year. Then there is education because uh, the snake is living in a human landscape. So they, they are in contact, everyday contact with the people. So it's necessary to educate uh, people, uh, local people or tourists or uh, other people they are, uh, that are in the landscape. Uh, then we also uh, focus on our reproduction research. For example, we measure the temperature uh, in the echoing signs uh, and we compare like different materials uh, and its impact on reproduction. And uh, of course, there is some long-term monitoring to, to know how uh, it's going. So uh, this is how the echoing site look like. Uh, it's nothing artificial, I think, uh, in the landscape. It's just like a small fence that is uh, filled with some organic material. 
we use uh, usually sawdust, uh, bark, straw, or some mixture of uh, garden, garden waste, let's say. Uh, this is quite a big one. It was, uh, this this um, Eklink site is one of the oldest one. And you can see that on the top, it's uh, also carved from the top because some, some it's like a prevent from uh, other animals to go inside and eat, for example, eggs. Uh, and on the top, you can see uh, these covers. They are uh, very useful in uh, snake monitoring because snakes like uh, are hidden under this, this covers. Um, we, uh, such a places we have up to now, we have almost 40 uh, acclaimed sites. So they are scattered uh, around the uh, whole locality. So it, it's quite a like, difficult job to take care about 80 uh, acclaimed sites. Uh, and let's have a look what, what's happening, how it looks like. Uh, so, because there is almost 40, there is a, a, a high diversity uh, between them in, I would say, shape, size, and also the used material. Uh, some of them are bigger, some of them smaller, and uh, they are usually situated in some corners of the grasslands or pastures. Um, so, it requires uh, cooperation with uh, farmers because it's usually their land. So, uh, and uh, it must be in open areas because snakes like uh, likes sunny places. Uh, and also it's quite useful when it's accessible by, by four wheel, at least four wheel car, because then uh, we can uh, manage them, we can repair and uh, add material. So uh, this is like the important parameters of the acclaimed signs. Uh, and how it uh, works during the year. Uh, this is the annual cycle of uh, Ekling sign. Uh, you can see the, the most important part for the snakes is, of course, spring, uh, when snakes emerge from the hibernating sites. Uh, and they are uh, sometimes accumulating uh, on, the, uh, on the locality. I think that uh, one record for us was the, it's this picture. Uh, there is uh, 28 snakes under one shelter. Uh, and in this density, sometimes you can see the male combat uh, or uh, mating, but these are like more, more secret, so there are not many chances to, uh, to watch them. Uh, and there is a lot, a lot of activities in the spring. Uh, then uh, the the beginning of summer, usually females lay their eggs inside the substrate, inside the material, and then the eggs are, are, like, uh, are incubated for two months, at least two months inside the, uh, inside the eggling site. So it's probably this period. And then uh, sometimes during the late summer or, or mostly but uh, at the beginning of autumn, uh, the youngs are hatched, and uh, when they are hatched, they are like staying for a few days in the uh, locality, and then they they leave. But uh, what will remain in the inside the material is the eggshell, and this is quite important for us because uh, it's quite clear evidence that uh, young babies of the snakes were hatched um, in the in the locality. So this part is most important for snakes. And this part is almost important for volunteers and uh, conservationists because we are trying to find uh, eggshells. Uh, uh, of course, later, usually later in the autumn, not to disturb the, the young ones. And uh, you can see that it's quite a difficult job. It usually needs uh, like tens of people. To do because we have 40, almost 40 acclaimed sites and uh, not, not enough time. And uh, also when we are finished with this, uh, the, the winter time, usually the beginning of or, or the end of the winter, is the time when uh, we do a lot of things uh, about the acclaimed sites, for example, repair the fence, uh, add the material and to prepare everything for the next season. 
uh, and uh, how uh, we are successful um, from the from the amount of the tackling sites about 31 is systematically monitored because some of them are in the private garden so we don't go to the private garden so often so uh, these are let's say outside so they are accessible easily uh, and a vast majority of the acclaimed sites is occupied by uh, Esclopian snake and approximately half of them is used for reproduction sometimes the acclaimed site is not used for reproduction but just like for shelter not uh, not used may, maybe later, but uh, for today it's um, half of them. And uh, in some good years, we can harvest uh, around 400 of eggshells together from the from the whole locality. And of course, there, there must be some places we, we don't know about them in some, some private gardens. So it's only the one part uh, that uh, we can like monitor. Uh, and if the question is how uh, snakes, how to survive in a human landscape, uh, it, we might say that for a scorpion snake, the, the answer would be easily because uh, they can find almost everything they need uh, in the human landscape. Usually around the houses, you can find food for a scorpion snake, it's like mice. Uh, then you can find a lot of possibilities to, uh, for shelter. Uh, you can find uh, echelane sites and you can find uh, hibernating or overwintering sites usually in some ruins. So uh, let's say that snakes have everything they need uh, in the human landscape. And you can see uh, in these pictures, the snakes don't avoid uh, even going inside the, 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 the houses. So these are the pictures from local people. You can you can spot them in the garden. It's still okay, but you can <laughs> you can sometimes see them you know, even in the toilet or uh, inside some some electricity box. So we should say snakes everywhere. And uh, I think that the local people are used to to spot the snakes, but still there are some people that they are not very happy to to have snakes uh, everywhere on each step. So the education is crucial and sometimes we save local people and uh, like move snakes a little bit to another appropriate locality. But of course, living in a human uh, landscape, it is also some dark side. Darker side, uh, there is a problem with traffic. Uh, sometimes uh, snakes want to cross the road and it can be dangerous because it's quite a frequent road connected to main cities. So there are, there are tracks and tracks uh, whole day. So it's not possible to cross. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, the snakes are not only crossing, they are uh, sometimes they are living just in, in the vicinity of the road because it's an uh, old one road. So there is a lot of dry stone walls uh, along the uh, along the road and they, they find a nice place to live because they like this uh, biotopes. And uh, surprisingly, uh, when snakes want to cross to the other side, they use tunnels or culverts under underpasses, the old underpasses that were originally made for water. So uh, they are used uh, by snakes. And you can, uh, quite often you can see snakes like just lying maybe one meter far from the road. And they are not disturbed by noise, by shaking, by nothing. But uh, what they don't take into account is like a huge machine. This is going regularly twice a year along the road and cutting the, uh, the ditches. So uh, it can be quite dangerous because they don't escape. They are used to uh, used to live there. So uh, that's the chance for volunteers. We usually uh, like uh, have some people, and we are like trying to to search snakes and uh, to save them. And in this case, it's quite good that it's only 12 square kilometers because we wouldn't be able to do it in the large scale. But these are just a few kilometers, so. Uh, it's possible and uh, we are able to save 
I would say 20 years, uh, 20 snakes per year at least. So it's not, uh, it's not useless. Uh, and because the snake is living uh, like near, near new people and near settlements, uh, the education is a, a crucial part for uh, essential part for, of the project. Uh, it's, it's very important and uh, it's, it must be um, intensive. Uh, the earlier, the better. Uh, you can see that uh, usually children are not afraid of snakes, but later there might be developed some mental blocks. So, but it's, uh, it's more difficult to get used to snakes later. Uh, and uh, it uh, the education uh, and uh, I would say snake conservation and snake project was the reason why uh, I personally moved from Prague to, uh, to the uh, to the locality and became a local in, uh, in this context. And um, now we uh, now we live uh, in Osvino. It's a, it's not even village. It's like a settlement, only a few houses and. At this place, there there is more horses than than people living in, the, in this place, and continuously uh, the, this place become a snake snake center. And uh, today, apart from our family house, uh, there is like a small information center open to the public. And since last year, there is like a big uh, environmental institute. Uh, that is in, in cooperation with Prokop Svoboda. Uh, you could hear it some uh, presentation before. And there is a uh, few more houses that are not connected uh, with snake activities, but still uh, there are there are people uh, that are cooperating. So uh, now we have place uh, where we can realize a lot of activities. Uh, there is uh, in environmental institute there is. Uh, some possibilities to accommodate few people. Uh, there is a hall for uh, presentation, and uh, that this is the small information center. It's mainly uh, in the summer, but it's open from the main road, if I can say, in just this small uh, village. Uh, and uh, we have also a park with uh, activities for children. There are some some insect houses and some uh, boxes for nests and some information boards. Uh, and we also have uh, all other snake species in outdoor uh, terrarium, let's say. And so, so people can, uh, can see the snake alive uh, when they wanted to, to see it. And they are not, uh, they don't disturb them in nature. They can see them uh, in, our, uh, in our center. Uh, and uh, before, the COVID time, we used to have uh, several like big actions for for public, uh, not only connected with snake, but usually uh, at some some other topics, and we cooperate with a lot of zoos and a uh, lot of a uh, lot of other people. So in this uh, small place, uh, we, there 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 were activities, and about two hundred people came to see. Uh, uh, some programs, some special program. And uh, of course, we uh, think on the younger population. So uh, it, it's usually accompanied by some activities, uh, especially for children and, uh, and families. So that's everything from my side. And I'm looking forward for your questions. Stop sharing. This one? Uh, no, the, the red, the, the red button. The red, uh, this uh, one? The, the, yes. Perfect. The shirt, the Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Radka, for your uh, presentation. It was we love such snakes. interesting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Team snakes. <laughs> uh, do we have a cough somewhere? No? Yes? Okay. No, okay, perfect. Good, so we are ready for questions. Uh -huh. Anyone who's Any up? Any question? Okay, yours. I should have a question. Uh, I assume money is uh, if the population is so isolated, so the number of actually the genetic keepers should be really low, so if you see some like inbreedings, uh, an anomaly or something, it's, it's 
okay, we were in this really isolated population. And my second question is, uh, if you have any evidence of the predation of especially like domestic pets like it's or this is problem, especially the population cost it. It's okay. really like really close to the, the, the yeah. Okay, uh, the first question, uh, there are some, because we make a photo of each snake, we can confirm that there are some uh, anomalies, uh, maybe uh, in the scales, in the polydosis. Uh, but I think it's difficult for snake population, and they are not very vulnerable, not so vulnerable to, uh, to this sort of inbreeding. But uh, there, there might be some the problem, and uh, we are planning to do some uh, some genetic research that it will be focused on population itself. Uh, but um, I think that there are no, no, not many problems. Um, so, so maybe this is not a problem. Uh, we will see. Uh, and the second, uh, because snakes are usually uh, living in the gardens, there, there, there is sometimes there is conflict between snakes and some uh, pets. And we have some evidence that usually the local people inform us that by accident her cat or dog like um, was able to catch a snake, but we can't avoid this because the snakes are like going to the garden. So, so it's not happening so often. Or... Oh, not, not so often, but not, 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 not so close to the. Because you know that the, the snakes are usually uh, like secret. They are they are usually hidden, so there's not many patients. So sometimes the snakes are living in the garden, and the people don't know about them until they are doing some reconstruction and they are going to the like abandoned corners or something like that. So because I don't like the problem if I even try to make some like. Uh... The friendly places and shelters for lizards and everything. And I I don't have the, the cats, but my neighbors have the cats, so I see that they, they are catching all lizards and this So I see that, that this could be the problem. Yeah, that could be. But uh, the advantage of the snake is that it's quite a big one, so maybe the cat. It's it's the the longest one or the biggest ones are maybe like too big. Or to be afraid. I would like to ask if there is any like expansion of the area of the population because you said you can monitor, you can be monitoring the population, so is there any prospect of expansion? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. If you can just uh, pitch the snake uh, uh, without a uh, without design by to you or, you know. Uh -huh. I know it's not necessary, but yeah. So, yeah, the first question there is some expansion. Uh, it's one of the goals of the action plan. To, to, uh, uh, it used to be, I would say, eight square kilometers, and now we are at least at 12, but uh, I think it's spreading. Uh, it, we are like building the acclaimed signs even of the, uh, on the edge of the current uh, distribution. So. And uh, snakes are easily like find, it, find can easily find a place and occupy. It. So uh, this it's is quite, quite positive that they can like uh, spread in the landscape. Uh, and because uh, today we, uh, we also use the social media, and uh, you know some people are making photos of the of what what's happening in the garden. So we found a lot of localities based on information from local people. So now we know that there are some localities a little bit few kilometers and snakes are like prospered there for a long time. So uh, that's good. Uh, and uh, the second question, uh, sometimes it's possible <laughs> to avoid biting and sometimes, sometimes not, but the snake is not venomous. So I. Uh, all, uh, because we don't, we try not to disturb uh, snakes so much. So it's why there is like in you know, study, and then there is ten, ten years gap, and then another study. Study. We uh, like monitor snake all the time, but uh, in this gap we avoid like catching them or disturb them. 
So, but when there is the study, you need to catch them and you are all like slide bitten. So it's not that you find uh, this snake uh, some, uh, hidden somewhere in your house and you can just uh, Yeah, it's why the local people usually call out because they are a little bit afraid to, to uh, touch him and it's it's going to be quite a big animal, so it's if you are not used to to get bitten, so it's <laughs> nothing pleasant. Uh, how do you uh, assess the population? You count eggs, but also we count some other uh, animals. And mm -hmm. if you count the time only if it's um, in your breeding site or if you do some um, whole I have assessment, or, I mean, you report it in the field? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the population size uh, assessment is based on mark recapture study. So uh, we mark uh, individuals by uh, cutting a small triangle on, onto the central side, and uh, you can recognize them easily maybe two or three years later. So uh, it's made only on adults because young ones are too small to, to make uh, so, such a mark. Uh, and uh, at this time, not only on like, the design, but everywhere in the landscape, every part, so, so it's uh, on the whole area. But there are some play, uh, places you are not able to uh, go, for example, private gardens and, uh, and so on. So uh, we think that the population size a little bit, it's a little bit higher because there is some part that uh, are not accessible for us. So the, the, the number, the 600, is uh, based on the era we are able to systematically uh, monitor and visit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, and, uh, how, you, you mentioned that you, you have some, like, after 10 years, some summary captures. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the proportion from the whole recapture? Uh, I think it might be maybe 10 percent, uh, quite a lot, uh, because th this was the, the, the number of 40, uh, 54, uh, the famous one, because that is, uh, the snake had a lot of anomalies, so uh, when I catch him, I easily recognize that, that the one from the previous study. Uh, I didn't have the idea that I could even meet the snake from the previous study. So uh, later, when I uh, uh, I had a closer look to the database of photo, and uh, I found maybe 20 more snakes that were already uh, in the first study. So after 10 years, they were still surviving. And surprisingly, uh, usually at the same place. Yeah. How many eggs did uh, the one female, <laughs> one female uh, can have from eight to twelve. So when you find, uh, at the, I think that our record for one acclaimed sign is, for example, one hundred twenty X. So it means ten, at least ten or twelve females together. It's typical for them that they join to to do it like. The, Together. I was thinking you have a lot of data, like it would be fantastic to, for example, the PVA on it to see. I, I have a feeling that the type of high survival mm -hmm. and it doesn't go much up for the population, so there should be probably high mortality of, of immigration or mortality of, of young ones. There is so, a and then if you have such a data, it would be really nice to do some models and I think there is high mortality of uh, youngs. Surely there, they said that there is 90% mortality during the first year, first uh, overwintering. Uh, and, uh, but uh, there was not a huge progress in compared to first and second study. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the population size assessment is based on adult elements. And uh, it takes five years to become like other ones. So if we if we just started with echoing science and all the things, I think that ten years is not enough to include the animals that, that were already born because of our, our measures of echoing science. So maybe the next one after the ten years, I'm. Mm -hmm.
Legal sim. I had uh, maybe a couple more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for people listening and all us watching, and um, what would be the minimum thing, the easiest thing that anybody could do in their gardens to to promote having the snakes? I mean, I would like to have snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's small, but but I think it's possible. So it's quite easy and it's uh, the best way how to protect the snake is to convince the local people that they have something unique and uh, to do uh, something for snake and uh, it's not difficult. Uh, snakes usually uh, like the compost heaps and usually who has a garden has also the, the compost uh, but it's necessary to put it on sunny place and don't dig uh, for example, in the summer, because there, there might be the eggs inside, so I like to, uh, to adjust the, the timetable of, uh, of the activities. So, uh, and uh, also, usually they, they can find a shelter um, in, in some wood, usually in garden, you have some wood prepared for fire or for something like that. So, so this is usually to protect it from rain, they are covered by some shelter and usually snakes love these places. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I think that there is, uh, don't disturb the snakes. Uh, be careful when you mow the grass because uh, it, that's the activity that is quite dangerous for, for uh, not only snakes, but a lot of amphibians, reptiles and so on. And, mm -hmm. and have a compost. <laughs> yeah. I have a few of those things. I'm still working on it, but but yeah. <laughs> And um, another question, maybe it's a bit more difficult and, and worthy of, of a whole discussion, but you, you saw an image, a fantastic image of, of a, a terrified woman holding a snake. And, and it, it brings so, so many thoughts. Like, like there is now, at least in social media in Spain, it's, it's like a huge pressure not to show yourself touching fauna. This, it's, it's getting even scary, like even as a biologist, but you have to do it, you post it, like, it or not. But it's clear that in some cases, the value is immense of, of a very care person who still, still I'm gonna there, I'm gonna touch the snake, the snake and I'm gonna feel that it's not dangerous. So, so I don't know if there is, is, if there is a question here, but what do we do? <laughs> like, should we touch them? Should we not touch them? Should we? It's important for, for example, children to to, to, to learn that it's okay. Maybe for some individuals that not are not very stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's the question. I think for people, it's really important to have a touch and to, to have the snake in your in your hand. And uh, we have usually one snake for for this uh, thing. So uh, it, it's not from the wild, but it's uh, like from some captivity. And uh, this snake, uh, I think, is uh, adapted. To, yeah, so uh, he doesn't bite, and so. This is like for, for this education purpose, we have to uh, devote one one animal to do to the to do this job because it's, mm -hmm. I think it's can bring the group. <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> sacrifice one. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, you said the population is increasing, uh, and is there still a little bit that is going to be the problem of uh, snakes to spread? And do you need to pull the river down or is 
that's not programmed in the I think the, uh, the habitat is quite nice, even of far from the from uh, our locality. Uh, it is necessary to say that we don't know exactly why the snake is uh, just only at this mm -hmm. small place. It's because there might be uh, very steep slopes uh, with a lot of uh, scree and uh, stone, stony places. Uh, but uh, even like a few kilometers on uh, each side, I think that uh, there is still possible uh, to survive for snakes because the landscape from my point, my point of view looks almost the same. Maybe not so steep slopes, but still some small villages, gardens, grasslands, pastures. So I think that there is place. And last year we found a locality that is uh, like 20 kilometers far. And, uh, it's in uh, near Paran. And there is a uh, surprise with quite a uh, lot of lot of animals. These mm -hmm. animals maybe maybe tens of them, and uh, we are not sure how they get to the locality because it's like twenty kilometers far. But it's a uh, uh, we study we study it these times. So that that might the one reason is that maybe we don't know, but it might be continuous along the river even. This 20 kilometers, but not so, not such a, a huge density as we are from scratch. So, yes, that would be studied. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Do you think that they can benefit the states from the climate change? Sometimes, uh, I think, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, the climate change uh, it's not that. If there were the only warmer, it would be good, but there might be some, you know, uh, like peaks, and that's not, not because, uh, especially uh, when the winter is moderate, uh, we can we can uh, meet much more young animals, like the newborns after the first hibernation, than in years when there is like a harsh winter. So uh, it, it surely have impact. But you know, there are, there are three moderate winters, and then it comes like with 20 degrees under zero. And... Okay. Any more questions? Something <laughs> <laughs> We are we can't be sure because you know if the animal died under the ground, uh, we probably won't know. Uh, we know there are some famous hibernating sites, so we can see the snakes in the uh, before winter and after winter. Uh, and I think that the main risk is especially the, the low temperature. Usually, the, the wintering sites uh, are not uh, affected by floodings because there are no no floodings. Um, in this area, so only the, only the uh, or, for example, uh, reconstruction. If uh, the animals are uh, hibernate in some ruins or some old houses, you never know what can happen during the winter. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I think we can make the lunch break now. It's about time, so, no? First of all, thank you, Zatka, for your Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, we can stop Go for a break and start eating. And start eating. <laughs> for people watching, we will be on a little field trip after lunch. Mm -hmm. We will be back around 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And so keep an eye on the YouTube channel and we will appear there shortly after four. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. See you later. Bye bye. Should I do it? Yeah, you can do it.
Hello everyone, welcome. Hope you had a, a nice lunch, a nice siesta. We are back in full strength, I hope. Mm -hmm. And Hello. <laughs> while we wait for the rest of our audience, we are gonna say hi to our next speaker. He's calling us from Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to let him in. Have a transatlantic call. Ah, okay. Just a second. Yeah. Okay. That's it. So, right. Right. So, who is going to to present now, Nando? David Jackson. Oh. No sé a qué cámara voy a mirar. Yeah, which one is my camera? Yeah. Uh, David, are you there? I think we lost no. him. No. We just lost him. He's out. Yes. Yeah, let's. Okay. <laughs> hey, again. Hey, he's again. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, we, while we wait for the rest of the audience, we can say hi to David and, and, and prepare everything. I think the video is ready here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's here. Hello. Can you hello. hear me? Yeah. Hello, hello. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. hey. Hello, How's it everybody? Hi there. <laughs> Still waiting for some of the audience, mm -hmm. but uh, we, okay. can, we can catch up a bit. I think we have a little bit of a delay. Mm. Ecuador is pretty far. That's <laughs> 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 Atlantic. As in a time delay between what I say and what you say when you receive it. Is that what you mean by a delay? Yeah. Yeah. No. I think okay. it's not. It's not bad enough so that we need to do like check, break. <laughs> yeah, I think. If we just give it after everything we say, maybe give a pause of a couple of seconds waiting for a response, kind of like that, then mm -hmm. then we can't, we're not talking over each other. That That is advisable even in normal conversation. Yes. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> Some people like to talk too much. <laughs> so, so now that we are just ourselves here in, in YouTube, uh, you could tell us where you are right now and... and uh, I mean, I think you are at a friend's house, you told me. I'm at a friend's house, yeah, in, in a town called Mera. Um, it's a beautiful place. There's a great view of the Rio, Pasta, Rio Pastaza just here, which is the river that goes all the way down to Peru to the Amazon River. But um, of course, if I was outside, there's too much noise, there's too much brightness for us to, I think, have a good um, a good conversation. Also, the signal strength would be a lot less outside. So um, I'm kind of on the inside, which I hope you don't mind. There's a little microwave behind me. and um, I could turn it the other way and we've got all the plates and the sink. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I hope people don't mind. It's uh, kind of a you know a, a rustic house, but um, I'm sure people won't be worried about that. Well, everybody's really happy and, and grateful that you could do this from from far away. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm grateful that people are prepared to listen. And uh, yeah, yes, I, yeah. Hope it goes well. I've got a few friends that I know are waiting for the thing to go to come on, and um, they might think that it's not going to happen and just switch off. But I think. A couple of them I've already told just to be patient, but there's a few others that I think uh, oh, it's not happening. But uh, yeah, are the, the people you're waiting for, is it the audience there in the Czech Republic? They're still um, here. Yeah. Yeah, they, they came, they just came from a, a field trip in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is full of water and mud. And so I guess yeah. they went to the room to get changed and, and they are coming mm. here. It's been a, a, tough, yeah. a tough two days. So we are Yeah, I can imagine. We have some of your friends in in the chat in, in YouTube already saying hi. Martin Swan oh, really? and Ben Mitchley Ahmed. Yeah, yeah, they're friends of mine. Well, one's my <laughs> cousin, one's a friend. Um, Martin actually is from the Czech Republic. Oh, and Norma from Houston. Yeah, Norma from Houston. Yeah, she's a good friend. Mm -hmm. Hi, Norma. I was living in Austin for two years, mm -hmm. some time ago. <laughs> and I love Texas. It was great, great fun. <laughs> yeah, I've never been to Texas. Um, I don't know if Norma, is Norma, can Norma hear the conversation or no? It's normally, sorry? 
can Norma hear the conversation? Can the people that are on hear what we're saying? Or they 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 are listening to us right now. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, Norma is <laughs> actually one of the people that helps. Where we're going to talk about some of the community support to mitigate um, conflict, and she's one of the people that um, kindly has helped a lot with um, funds for the school project, which you know gives the kids an alternative. Um, and it's something that's like a contraparte, almost like an agreement where the people get the support in the agreement that they come to us if there's any bear inflicted damages so we can um you know we can do that rather than going hunting the bears there's always that's like a solution in a way one of the one of the things we're going to talk about in the, nice. in the conference so so norma is one of the really important parts to that and i really appreciate it for it and, um, hey martin tronco <laughs> chaval and um martin's from the czech republic but lives in spain in madrid <laughs> the world is an <laughs> it's amazing mm. What do you think? Can we just go for it. Okay. Um, I, I think people are okay in waiting. I just don't know uh, how long people are going to... I'm happy waiting. I, I'm sure everybody else is. But whatever you think. I think we will go ahead just to... Just, just, just to... Not to keep the schedule, not to keep delaying it. So sure. what we will do now is to share the video from our side. And okay. We will silence here. You will not... not well, we'll not hear our voice, but you can see the video in, in YouTube. And by the right. end, we will we will connect again with you. Okay, okay. sounds good. <laughs> okay, so okay, well, right. enjoy everybody. David Jackson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> enjoy, so, sorry for... <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Okay. Thank you. See David. you on the other side. See you on the other see side. You on the other side. <laughs> One second there. <laughs> we cannot get your sound. Voy a abrirlo con el otro por ver si se puede. Yeah. Hi everybody. Uh, it's a success story. From... Uh -huh. Hi everybody. Uh, o sea, esto es el audio este. Voy a hangar out. Vale, ok. Now, yes, it works. What was it? Que, no, que estaba saliendo por otro lado. <laughs> We have a lot of connections here. And so... okay, ok, second try. Here we go. <laughs> vale. Uh -huh.
they can hear in on YouTube. Uh, Let's go back in. Hi everybody, I uh, hope you're having a great time with the ALKA Wildlife Conference in the Czech Republic. Unfortunately I couldn't be with, there with you, um, well I suppose it's not too unfortunate, I'm in a great place myself. Here I am in the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador, this is where I live and where I've spent a number of years working on wildlife conservation projects in human landscapes and I'm looking forward to giving you a presentation on that subject. So I hope you enjoy the presentation, I hope you're all well and hopefully we will meet each other one day in another conference somewhere once uh, all these restrictions are finished. So you all take care and um, yeah, enjoy the presentation. Okay, so let's get started on my presentation on strategies for mitigating human bear conflict in the Ecuadorian Andes. First of all, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is David Jackson. I'm a British biologist who's lived in Ecuador for 19 years now, working with Andean bears, with mountain tapirs, with a number of different species in the Amazon region in conservation efforts, which include rescue, rehabilitation, and reintroduction to the wild of species, and also research initiatives as well. So, um, you know, the experience I've got, I'm going to share with you in this presentation today. Uh, let's begin with talking about why conflicts have arisen between human beings and wildlife. Um, of course, for millennia, human beings and wildlife have lived in harmony 
um, as one part of nature and over the last few centuries that's kind of changed where uh, human beings have kind of separated from nature and almost believe that they're superior and this has led to a number of different conflict situations and a number of different issues that we're seeing today as far as conservation efforts are concerned and we're going to talk about how we've mitigated those efforts in the Ecuadorian Andes and in, and in the Amazon uh, using strategies that we've found successful and hopefully they can be helpful for your projects wherever you are in the world. I think it's vital for us as human beings to understand that we were, are and always will be part of nature and part of the natural tapestry that makes up planet Earth and once we can do that we can start to look at ways where we can improve things for ourselves and for nature at the same time because a healthy natural environment is necessary for humans to survive and also for nature to survive it's really important that us as humans do our part and try and do our bit to give something back to mother nature and, and do our bit to conserve the natural environment which almost depends on us at the moment because of the ways that we've negatively impacted it over the past few centuries as I mentioned. So let's talk about the major conservation issues we face here in Latin America. As with the rest of the world, conservation efforts are focused upon a number of man-made impacts due to the increase in population, which has led to an increase in demand for materials and resources and space, which have had knock-on effects on a number of wild populations through habitat destruction and fragmentation, where habitat's been um, chopped down or destroyed, and that's led to the isolation of populations, which also in turn leads to a, a weakening of the gene pool, and therefore it's really putting at risk the longevity of the spe of, of species. Also encroachment, which is also down to habitat destruction, where the human, the ironically named human domain, is becoming closer to wild populations and leading to a number of human conflicts. At, in turn, that leads to more hunting and poaching. There are resource extraction initiatives by mining companies and petrol companies throughout the world. Agricultural practices are becoming more and more reliant on chemical pesticides and pollution is a result of that and a number of other human activities. And of course, everything leads to climate change. There's one common denominator with all these factors. It's all caused by us and we're the only ones that can change that. So how can we have the greatest conservation impact? I think to have the biggest impact, we need to target vitally important areas of ecological significance and that are under the biggest threat. And these areas are critical habitats for endemic and endangered and vulnerable species, obviously places where these species exist, biodiversity hotspots, um, maybe as you saw in the previous maps, there's a number of areas that are clusters biodiversity hotspots like in this area for example the Choco bioregion or the tropical Andes which are two crucial biodiversity hotspots that have um, a wealth of species, a wealth of diversity and they really are endangered so it's vital to protect them. Unique and rare habitats such as the Frailejon Paramos, the Paramo ecosystem is, is unique and it's only found between northern Peru and the south of Panama so it's vital to to protect that. And augmented habitats, ones that have been um, fragmented and forest patches are separated from each other due to our impact in deforestation. And the marine environment, one of the environments that is the most important to protect but it's the most forgotten of all because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind as I guess so to speak. However, despite being out of our sight, it's so important to protect the marine environment. It's got such an impact on terrestrial ecosystems, on ourselves, on everything, that the marine environment is one of the most important that we need to protect. It's also crucially important to protect areas on a regional level, uh, areas that are vitally important for certain species, life history events, for example, nesting sites and breeding sites. Uh, with our studies here, we've noticed that a lot of nesting sites where Andean bear mothers are um, looking after their young in the maternal nest. <clears throat> it's getting so close even to within a few hundred meters of human settlements and human populations basically, basically because um, these areas are really really sought after and they're very specific to the needs of the mother in the sense of shelter from the wind from the rain that they have to 
look after and protect their young in areas that are so close to human populations. Um, again, we'll talk about wild, uh, wildlife corridors and habitat fragmentation. When the forest patches are cut off from each other, um, individuals from a species cannot interact with each other, they can't mate, and this is again causing problems with the genetic makeup of the, of the populations, and it's vital to protect the wildlife corridors, and if not protect them, to regenerate them and reforest them. Um, isolated patches of habitat abundant in foodstuffs are really important. There's a lot of places where, for example, there's a lot of, lot of trees that have certain fructification cycles where they're really important to a species' um, longevity and a species' and a population's um, proliferation. So it's so important to protect those areas too. Again, in arid environments, waterholes are really important to protect um, oases, places where there's some forest cover in the middle of deserts, and salt licks, which are really important as well to, to species. Also on a species level, I think it's really important to consider our conservation efforts in human landscapes. Um, critically en endangered, endangered and perhaps vulnerable species, I think, should be focused on first, um, the ones that are most in need, of course, um, you know, whether they be large mammals, whether they be small insects, um, it's all the same, but it's really important to, first of all, study and then try and protect the critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable species, and maybe even the ones that haven't been discovered yet, of course. And also keystone and umbrella species, um, for example, the Andean bear is, we like to call it the gardener of the cloud forest ecosystem here in Ecuador, um, basically because he has a number of behaviours that um, promote the regeneration of the cloud forest and also maintain the dynamic of the cloud forest at the same time, whereas in the sense that they will open up clearings through their climbing behaviour, which en enables the undergrowth to come through. Also, they prune back um, tank bromeliads, which is vital for the hydrological cycle. So species that have a, a great effect and due to their protection, you're protecting a number of other species. I believe it's important to protect those species in particular. So let's move on to factors influencing conflict and I'll focus specifically on our study area here where, you know, obviously it might be different to other people's, but I'm sure there's certain things that ring true in many, many ecosystems, many study areas too. So something that influences the conflict is the proximity of crops or pastures to wild habitat. For example, uh, here, the, the local people um, are unable to plant the crops right next to the house, which also is to do with the distance of crops and pastures from settlement, which is the second point there. Um, they have to, um, due to the land use here, um, often plant their crops and have their livestock right next to wild habitat and far away from the houses. Often people here um, have their livestock eight hours walk away from, from where they live, so they've got to go maybe once every week, every two weeks even. And during that time, a bear or a puma or a jaguar or any other um, predator could have eaten a calf, could have eaten a, a live, a full-grown cow, and this is causing huge problems where um, it's really affecting the harmony that should exist between humans and nature. Um, the agricultural and sustenance practice of local populations, um, obviously dependent upon what people decide to grow, what people decide to have as a means of income, and this is something that is always difficult, for example, where people will tie their cows up to better use their um, pastures, which is perhaps not the best way, but it's the way that people know. And because the cows are tied up, of course, it's like they're like sitting ducks, pardon uh, the pun, and they um, are easy easy prey for the, for the bears or for the jaguars or for the pumas as well in, in this environment, of course. Um, the movement and diet of wild populations obviously depends upon the diet of the population, whether there's going to be a conflict or not, and how they move, how they move between forest patches. We'll talk about the corridors again. When they disappear, they're more likely to pass through pasture land, which is going to cause heightened um, levels of impact of conflict. And cultural tra traditions. Um, often people go up not just because they want to clear land, not just because they um, are wanting to put cows in an area, they will... Traditionally, because it's been done through generations, they will go and burn the Paramo ecosystem up in the high grasslands, and this is causing a massive impact as well on wild populations of a number of species, not just obviously the larger species. It's it's having a whole effect on the on the entire food chain. 
So I'm just going to talk about um, one part of our project, which is the reintroduction programs or reinsertion programs of Andean bears back into the wild. Uh, basically, we work with the Ecuadorian Ministry of Environment and the Environmental Police to rescue bears that have been in very deprived conditions. You can see the bear cub in the top left corner here. Uh, we rescued her. She was tied up, chained up, um, stood up. She couldn't even lay down, um, sleeping in her own excrement. And um, basically, we rescued her. Uh, you can see our veter veterinarian wildlife vet, Leonardo there, Dr. Leo. And um, he's checking the the teeth of the bear. You know, he, they, they go through a whole um, health screening process. And then there's a decision process made to see whether they can go on to a rehabilitation program or not, whether they can be re reinserted back into the wild. Obviously, that depends on, on a number of factors. But the same bear you can see in the top left corner, you can see here in the bottom right corner. And she is not just um, successfully released back into the wild, she's also... Um, had a cub, she's an offspring in the wild, which is a real success story from taking a bear from such conditions throughout the whole rehabilitation process. You can see a helicopter here sometimes where possible we will um, take them to the release sites in helicopters, but unfortunately it's not always possible. So occasionally down at the bottom here, you can see we have to carry them on our backs as well at times, which is not easy, but um, sometimes necessary. Um, and there we are, that's the rehabilitation and reintroduction side of our project. One of the real success stories, I believe, to our reintroduction programs um, to minimize and to um, to evade conflict is to select a suitable release site. The, the release site is so important. It's some, something that um, perhaps a lot of projects don't consider, but it's really important, especially in human landscapes where, um, you know, if you release a bear or animal too close to a human population, you're almost certainly going to get problems because they've had imprinting throughout the rehabilitation process as, as much as you want to minimize the contact that you have with those animals there's always going to be something that will kind of attract them to human populations and cause conflicts so um, through our uh, research program which is another part of our study which is on the next slide um, we have found out information on wild bear ecology which has really really helped our um, reintroduction programs Apologies, I got cut off there. My battery ran out and I had to go and charge my computer. So, um, as I was saying, um, conflict situations really can only be mitigated in reintrodu reintroduction programs and with any other conflict mitigation process um, when projects are complemented with a research initiative where, where we learn about the bear's ecology, where we learn about various different species ecology to enable us to better manage, better handle those species and the conflicts that they have in human landscapes. And we're going to talk about the research side of things. So obviously with the research of wild animals, uh, you can find a number of information out. Uh, what we've done with the bears is we've captured bears, put radio or GPS collars on them to track them with telemetry equipment. And we've begun to put together home ranges, core areas, movement patterns, habitat use and a number of different information that is so important to mitigating conflicts and to, you know, pr preserving that um, harmony that exists or should exist between humans and nature. So you can see in the top left here, um, there's uh, eight diff nine different bears, home ranges. On the top right, we've got mountain tapirs that we've collared and we've got the um, home ranges for those and also the movement patterns and habitat uses also. Um, you can see down near the bottom left here you can see some arrows on the chart which are wildlife corridors that we've identified through our research which is really important um, again with the conflict, conflict mitigation. Um, activity patterns down, down on the bottom right here uh, which kind of gives us an idea when the bears are most active, when they're not active and just a few pictures of, of me I guess and Armando my colleague um, collaring bears, um, taking blood samples when we've uh, captured a bear, listening for them with their radios and, and so on. So research initiatives are so important. It's a crucial part of any conflict mitigation um, procedure in, in any environment, I believe. Whatever species you're working with, obviously you can't radio collar every, every, every species dependent upon size. But um, to protect natural environment, it's really important to 
research the native populations. Okay, so um, we're going to quickly talk about the conflict mitigation. I, I believe there's a number of ways we can do that. Um, and one of those is incidence mapping. Basically, when you're finding out the areas, obviously, that are agricultural areas, which are going to be at high risk for farmers to put their crops, put their livestock. And you can see a chart to the top right here. Um, the red areas are generally the areas that are going to be of major concern if anybody does put any, any livestock or any crops there, that there may be a problem. So we advise against that. And um, obviously, you can't just advise people not to do something. You've got to try and give alternatives. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, it's really important to be able to advise where and where not it's advisable to um, put their crops and livestock. Um, compensation programs, um, we'll, we'll talk in detail about all these in a minute. Deterrence, um, like dogs, fireworks and things like that. Non-destructive alternative practices, provide community support as a mitigation tool, environmental education, awareness initiatives, and also it's really important with the information you get from the research is to lobby for legislation change and government support to any project that you've got. OK, we'll talk about incidence mapping really quickly. Um, so you can see the charts here. Um, you know, you start to get an idea of where the bears are moving, each individual bear and also generally as a population, which areas they generally they spend more time in, probably due to the fructification cycles of certain trees, due to um, cornfields being planted near the near the forest in certain areas. So really it gives us an idea of where we can predict the areas of conflict and it provides us a tool to advise local farmers on the positioning of, farm, on, of farms, pastures, livestock and crop fields. So it's a really important tool and it's really good to work with the locals in order to um, you know, get a, a better layout of, of human land use. Um, compensation programs, it, it could be a um, a dubious one where a lot of people don't believe they work. I, I do believe they work. We've got first-hand experience that they do work. Obviously, we don't believe it's a, a long-term solution, but it, it certainly gives people a, a tangible return for bear inflicted damages. And the people are really happy with uh, the good breeds of, of livestock that we provide that, you know, it won't um, compensate the whole loss that they've got, but it definitely will um, enable them and it will um, foster a relationship between them and us, and it will help us in the future to um, collaborate and cooperate with, with communities. Uh, we do believe it maintains a healthy bond with projects and community. It does need uh, expert field coordination to go and check on what damages have been done and also to the extent of damages. But um, we, with our um, experience, believe that it's a, a viable, at least short term solution to the problem. So we'll talk about deterrence just really quickly. Um, the deterrence with Andean bears, we, we, we haven't had much success with them. The bears have generally got the intelligence that they learn um, to avoid them, to evade them. So, um, you know, some people use recordings of dogs barking, electric fences, barbed wire fences. Um, also with the, the layout of the land here, it's really impractical to use fences because there's so many small farmsteads really close to the mountains that to provide every single landowner with um, the fencing equipment is, is very difficult and almost impractical in ways. I don't have any pictures of that because I've been working on this in the mountains. So just two pictures of, of the dogs here that we have. And uh, yeah, next. Um, community support, I believe, is a really, really important tool where we work together with communities, uh, providing them support, um, especially in areas surrounding bear habitat, wild species habitat in general, um, which really helps reduce conflict. For example, I set up a school truck project uh, which is now a school bus I guess um, it's evolved over the years and this has been going on for 17 years now and um, it's provided the the kids uh, a way of getting to school they were never able to go to school so the boys were going to work in the fields at a very young age back breaking work the girls were basically um, leaving school to work in the kitchen with their mothers and it was they were they were having kids early it was basically a vicious cycle of poverty so to enable them to get a secondary education has really helped them it's something they never had the opportunity for in the past and um, that has really with the um contrapart um i'm thinking in spanish with the um agreement that they um don't go and hunt the bears or don't go and kill the bears for any damages that are done they come to us it's really really had a massive impact on on the bear populations in the local area and a positive impact on the locals too. Um, another, um, I guess, community project, but it's also a non-destructive alternative 
source of income um, is tourism. Community tourism projects really do provide sustainable, non-destructive alternatives to the slash and burn farming. Um, I found funds and we've been setting up a community tourism program. And as you can see, we've built a community tourism lodge or it's, it's well, it's further on than that. Again, I didn't have the photographs. And um, it's a real way of, you know, uh, not just them appreciating what they've got, but it, it, once they're teaching other people about the beauty of their of their area uh, in these projects, then they start to appreciate it a bit more themselves. So it, it's really a so as I was saying, it, it's a real way of um, them gaining an income from doing something that's non-destructive, and also it's a way of them gaining a even more enhanced appreciation of of the place they're from of the place they live in too, which is a great thing. Another non-destructive sustainable source of income is through uh, different ways of agriculture, alter alternatives in agriculture as well that have a minimal impact on the environment. Uh, for example, um, crops and products that use less space, they, have, they avoid the need for wide-scale wide destruction, use less pesticides, provide greater income, and can be set up as a community initiative to get the people involved on a, on a community level. Um, a couple of the projects, one project that I would like to set up here in the Amazon, uh, we're just getting into this, is to uh, plant vanilla, potentially in greenhouses or under the shade of forest. So obviously under the shade of forest, it, it promotes the protection of the forest rather than the chopping down of it. And with a greenhouse, it's a small scale intensive project that isn't using chemicals that will really help the people too. Um, there's a number of different uh, fruits in the Amazon. There's pitahaya down here, uh, pepinillo over here. And they're also things that can be grown on a small scale, space-wise, and can provide good income so that the people aren't chopping hectares and hectares of forest down for their livestock, uh, which certainly can be another alternative. And these alternatives are so important to enable the people to, um, you know, to continue to survive, but at the same time, they're not having a negative impact or having a less negative impact on the environment itself. I have a feeling my camera's gone, so I'm going to do a bit more, do something. So many apologies, I think you lost my camera there. I think you can live without me for a little bit. Um, okay, another um, conflict issue is roads and highways bisecting habitat. You can see in the top right here, um, there's um, the interoceanic highway that goes from the Andes to the, um, to the Amazon in the Sucumbias province. And you can see that this highway, and this is only the few bears that we've had um, collared in this area, is bisecting four different um, bear home ranges, which is obviously a major problem where the bears have to cross this massive uh, four lane, busy highway to get from one area of where they eat and, and the, the breeding sites and the maternal de denning sites to the, to the other. So it's really a difficult situation. Um, down in the bottom left here is a bear that was unfortunately found in the middle of the road. I think she, the mother was startled by a car and the, the cub fell off her back. They generally um, carry them on their backs. And because the person picked it up, the mother was probably by the side of the road and um, she, she was looking for it. But unfortunately, somebody had taken it to be rescued. So we tried to uh, reunite the cub with mother the following day, but unfortunately, she'd gone. Um, the same thing here with a t mountain tapir uh, that we're putting a collar on so we can study it. Um, was a mountain tapir that was um, at the side of the road that had had um, some injuries. So uh, we had to, um, you know, make sure it was of good health and then we released it at this further away from the road, but unfortunately we're always going to have those problems. Um, so at the, sorry, at the Andean Bear Foundation, um, the ways we mitigate these problems are by, um, we've got a road, sign, road signage system, especially throughout areas where there are um, known bear crossings, corridors that the bears use between um, patches, between core areas. Um, we've put speed reducers on certain highways to stop the cars from going as fast. Um, Awareness programs with the people, um, you know, so that they're aware that the, the bears are endangered, they need protecting. Um, something that we haven't done, but is a possibility in the future, perhaps ecological bridges. You can see one down at the bottom here and, and corridor tunnels below the highways, which do happen in other countries. We haven't got the funds for that. We haven't got funds for much, to be honest. But hopefully in the future, we can start to do things like this as well, which is certainly a, a very recommended tool. OK, so. Um, Another thing that we do here is habitat restoration and reconnection. So I mentioned the corridors down at the bottom left here. We can see some identified corridors in the Intag region of the Andes. And uh, we have identified these corridors and started to reforest them. And uh, basically that will reconnect the, the forest patches and allow the bears and other animals to safely pass between, between their core areas, which is really, really vital. Um, 
so um, you can see some videos some pictures here of um, reforestation programs with the locals um, you know local community projects where the locals are planting trees with the schools with um, international volunteers that visit us occasionally and uh, this is a really really important tool to be able to help um, prevent these problems that are caused by highways that are caused by the deforestation of the wildlife corridors too um, so environmental education is another key issue where um, it's really important to the project success working with local schools um, focusing on the younger generation which are generally the ones that are going to soak up that information more than the adults not to say that the adults wouldn't learn as well but of course they're more set in their ways i guess and make it interactive make it fun take them on field trips um, and foster a love and respect for nature it's something that we do you know you can see with the um the bear so yeah you can see the kids have a lot of fun with the the bear costume and you know all the all the great things that we try and do with them whether it be in the field whether it be in the classroom and uh, it's a real fun event and it really does foster that love and respect for nature within the kids i mean we don't just do it with the bears but it's a focal issue it's i guess a flag flagship species and um you know obviously we do talk about and and teach about other uh, species and the importance of protecting the environment as a whole too um, so we really believe something that we've always done and I've mentioned this a lot in the presentation is local community involvement is crucial to the success of any project. I think a lot of projects fail because they don't have the locals involved with them and it's something that is really important. Um, involve them in the research activities, create an interest in our work, collaborate with community events like community work days, they call them Mingas here. We can train marketable conservation skills, for example, with the locals that we've um, trained up to be field assistants trying to use local people as much as possible and um, also obviously to respect and know the culture and really you know try and become part of the community not just somebody who's coming to the area and studying a species or trying to protect the environment and not really getting involved which is i think where a lot of projects fail before they've even started so that's such an important thing that i really really emphasize to anybody who wants to set up a project that please um, get the community involved um, okay, in summary, um, so basically conservation efforts are a priority in human landscapes as wildlife are at more higher risk. Uh, research is a key to understanding and dealing with conservation issues at hand. Research is so important and we need to continue to promote that harmony between humans and nature. I do believe we can get that back and, and we can only get that back by, by educating, by teaching, by making people... It's, it's so important to promote the harmony between humans and nature. I really do. We can recreate that. We can get that back as to what it was. Maybe not to the same level, but you know, people are getting more interested in the environment and we can do a lot by educating, by making people more aware. We can provide non-destructive sustainable sources of income as, as a possibility to prevent the slash and burn farming techniques and, and you know, give people a good living without affecting the environment negatively. Many people don't want to... Um, negatively impact the environment but sometimes they've got no choice so if we give them another choice i'm sure they'll be very interested in that one and also of course educate and involve locals in any conservation initiative as i've just said which is so crucial to the success in in protecting and conserving wildlife in human landscapes okay so finally i'd like to thank you all sorry about the technical issues I, um thank everybody that's present in the conference i really appreciate you listening and i hope you've i've been able to help in some small way uh, to any project that you may be setting up. Thanks to Alcohol Wildlife for the invitation. Uh, thanks to Fernando um, and of course Conservation Careers. That's the only reason I was presenting here today. Um, obviously the Andean Bear Foundation is there. The other foundation I work with, Fundacion. Apologies for the technical issues, um, but I just wanted to wish everybody the best of luck with their wildlife conservation endeavors wherever you are and everybody have a, the best of times and the best of luck with everything. Take care, bye-bye. Ahora. Ok, thank you, David, for your presentation. It was so interesting, I think. A lot of work. I'm so impressed. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work. I mean, I, I was watching it myself, and you know, there's things that I probably could have presented in a better way, but hopefully, uh, people got the gist of things. And you know, if anybody's got any questions, um, please feel free to ask me um, anything that wasn't quite clear or anything that you're interested in finding out as well. Sure. So I'm going to 
Bueno. Okay. So we are so setting this up so you can see the audience. Okay. Great. <laughs> you could see them all. Maybe there's a familiar face there. There are people here. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Coming? No. Sí. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. So. Questions? Do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, hello, Mary. Uh, can you can you tell us some, if you have some figures how this has changed the acceptance of the local people to the bar over the years into your work? I mean, do you, do you have any idea if, if they are more open to tolerate the species there, or how is it? I couldn't hear that particularly well. Is there any way that um, somebody nearer to the camera, maybe Fernando? Uh, could, could, could just to give me the question. I'm sorry about that. We can, we can repeat the question. Um, basically, it's uh, do you have any data figures or a, even a feeling of how the perception of the people has changed, like the acceptance of the fauna uh, of the bears in, in this time? And maybe it, it is different for some locations where you have done different things. For sure. Um, yeah, that's thanks for the question. Uh, that's a really good question. We have done um, surveys on, on people's in, people's opinions, people's um, beliefs towards the bears, you know, throughout different time frames, uh, maybe um, two, three years apart to see how opinions are changing. Um, of course, with the environmental education programs that we do, um, we've noticed a difference in people's, people's opinions, uh, people's interest in trying to protect the environment, people um, that are more conscious of their impact on the world and also um, of the importance of protecting the natural environment as far as, um, you know, maintaining the water, the, the hydrological cycle, maintaining the water levels, maintaining a healthy environment, which is something that everybody relies on. So um, we have noticed a difference in people's opinions over the year. I've got surveys um, that obviously I didn't put on the presentation, but we do do that. And uh, it's something that I find really important to get people's opinion especially in areas that are surrounding bear or any other of course any other species habitat i have a question maybe you can also translate it no, 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 no. Ah, okay so i have a question um you didn't mention uh, were bears already before in that area or it was like uh, uh, Reintroduction and and how many years was the uh, the gap where when bears were not there because it can of course have an impact on uh, on the conflict because for example if there is a long gap the people uh, are already not used to that animal and they don't know for example how to care about uh, uh, cattle in the way that it's safe from the bears? Okay, um, so I think the question was um, if, the, if the bears were already present in the area where we've released them back into the wild and I missed a little bit in the middle, what was the rest? Um, there was something about, could you maybe just continue that? Sorry, Fernando, it's just a little bit difficult with the distance from the microphone to, or maybe uh, just without the lips, I apologize. Um, yeah, just to okay. get, make sure I answer the question correctly. Uh, if bears were in the area uh, before the project, before the reintroduction of them, and how long was the gap between they were there and the new, new introduction? Because it can have, of course, co consequence to how to solve the conflict because uh, if people are used to bears, uh, I mean, for example, how they uh, have cattle in the landscape, if there, if there was, if they were, if there is a knowledge how to protect uh, the, yep. uh, yeah, the cattle against bears. Okay, um, thanks for the question. Uh, that's great. And um, so I guess one thing that I'd, I'd clarify there is that I, I did use the word reintrodu reintroduction, reintroduce. It's a, it's a word that I, I guess we use here and it's kind of accepted as a word um, whether there is a, uh, an existing population or not. I know that I think the correct definition of the term is for reintroduction is somewhere where the bears were and then they've been 
they've, they've disappeared and then they've been released back where they weren't before. So in our case, we've, we've released bears always in areas where the bears have already been present and it's to um, boost the populations because we've seen a massive population decline, although the bears do still exist in the places where we've released them back into the wild. Um, so the, hum the, the people have always been aware, well, they've been aware that the bears are present, the bears are quite elusive. So a lot of people, even in the areas around surrounding bear habitat don't even realize they've got bears in the mountains sometimes but um bear andean bears are opportunistic and generalistic feeders so they generally um, will eat pretty much what they come across and it hasn't been a major problem in the past it's only over the last maybe two centuries that andean bears have started to to predate, depredate cattle um we've seen um, a natural behavior of andean bears being generalistic opportunistic feeders they have um, hunted and and killed mountain tapirs uh, another species that we work with so that's something that um, there's um, records of going back to when the Spaniards first came to South America maybe 500 years ago or something like that so they certainly do have the predatory behavior obviously they are carnivores um, strictly speaking as far as uh, the taxonomy is concerned and um, despite being carnivores from the order carnivora taxonomically, uh, Andean bears generally have um, kind of, they've um, sort of gone away from hunting and they, I would say they're probably about 90% vegetarian. They, they generally eat um, lots of uh, bromeliads, lots of wild fruits, um, types of bamboo, types of palms. So it's, it's not, it, it's, it is part of the diet. They'll eat small rodents, they'll eat um, small mammals. Um, they'll eat insects and they'll start digging in the ground. And then they do have this behavior where they occasionally have um, hunted mountain tapirs in the past. And the, the problem with cattle um, probably started in the 1990s, 2000s. And, and um, it's probably something that has been a cause from um, this problem that we're talking about in the conference, which is um, wildlife conservation and human landscapes. Obviously, the, the human landscape, the, the agricultural boundary um, was getting closer and closer to natural environment it was taking away the natural foodstuffs of the bears obviously from deforestation and um, instead of the um, forest being there the cattle was placed there and then people then the bears have started coming down and eating eating the livestock it's generally only one or two problem bears in in a certain region it seems like they've almost they've certainly got a social hierarchy within the population and there's one one bear that will cause the problems it will be the one that hunts the uh, the cattle it's generally a large male but not not specifically and um you know for example people could say that the solution would be maybe to um relocate the, the problem bear this is something that uh, we've discussed and we believe that relocating a problem bear is still the problem's not going to disappear because there, there will always be another male or another bear that will take his place as the maybe the the dominant one in the in the region and um, they will be the ones that predate cattle from there because obviously once a bear uh, problem bear, as we call it, um, does depredate a cattle, a live head of cattle. Um, it will eat what it can, and then the other bears will come in and uh, kind of feed on the rest as well. So they will get that taste for meat. It's almost like they will um, almost they will taste meat, and then they will they want to go back for more. If you like, it's something that they realize is a really good nutritional food source, and then they will go back uh, because they've kind of lost that predatory instinct as well. Something that's interesting, as you saw probably with some of the photographs. Andean bears don't go for a quick kill like um, other predators generally do, like go for the jugular of the bane and, and kill the animal or, or jaguars where they almost crush the skull when they when they predate. Um, the Andean bears will jump on the, the, the livestock or the cow's back and start ripping chunks out, which it's really horrible. You can see those photographs. It must be a horrible experience, of course, for, for any um, livestock, whether it be a cow or a horse or anything like that. And um, it's a very slow and painful death if the, if the actual animal does die, but sometimes they do survive from it. But um, it's something that, you know, is another indication that they have lost that predatory instinct, but they've, have, they've gone back to it again and they're starting to um, predate, but they're not going for it in, in the way that perhaps um, other bears or other predatory animals would. Um, so I, I know I'm going off on tangents there just to explain a few things, but um, to answer your question, it's actually a reinsertion, I guess, to say that we've done. It's not, a, a, strictly speaking, a reintroduction. And um, yeah, the people have been aware of the bears in the region, but it's not been a problem with the cattle until over the last couple of decades. Um, is there anything that you want to add, add to that, those questions just uh, to clarify anything that I may have said? Um, sorry, I didn't get the name of the person who asked the question. 
Well, if there is any other question here in the ask if it's dangerous for the women to get the virus. Yeah. 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 Or if there are other people. I'm also a part of garbage places. If they, if they, if they, if they, like, like, like brown burns, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, they are asking here if, if there is any risk, uh, direct risk for humans. Are humans uh, directly scared of the birds? And are there known attacks at any point? And also, if there is a problem with garbage sites, like places where people. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, with as far as um, human safety, um, it, it's very rare. Andean bears try and avoid human contact at all costs. Um, they're, as I said, they're very elusive. They're very shy species where they they try and they don't really want to come down close to um to human settlements uh, so there's not really a problem not really a risk of anybody being attacked the only situations in which i would suggest that there may be a possibility of somebody getting attacked is if they um if they get between mother and cub that could cause an uh, cause an accident it, it could cause uh, an attack um there's not been any anybody that's been killed by an andean bear and as far as i'm i'm aware um, you know, in the history of the whole continent from northern Argentina up to up to Colombia and up to western Venezuela. I don't think there's any any um, incident where an Andean bear has actually killed a, a human being. Uh, I know that farmers have tried to shoot the bears. And once the farmers do start shooting at the bears, the bears will occasionally chase them. Um, but there's not been any any serious injuries that have been provoked or caused by that. And the other Part of that question. Sorry, there's just somebody at the door. I'm just going to tell them there's nobody here. Sorry about that. And sorry, the, the other part of the question was, um, can you just remind me of that? Um, the garbage site or, or dumping? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know that's a big problem with other bear species. Um, you probably could see, a, a, it was a, one of the photographs there with a bear in a garbage um, bin or, or a trash can. Um, that was actually a reintroduced bear that was you know, released too close to, um, it was, that was a hacienda. It was a, a one building in the middle of 26,000 hectares of land. And the bear actually um, made its way back there and started causing problems in the hacienda. It actually went inside, inside the, the place and sat down. Well, it kind of went in there and took the food in the kitchen and, and it was taking um, the trash, as you say. But um, with wild bears, I've not had any problems with work with bears looking through trash cans like they like they do in parts of Europe and the, and the USA and Canada. So uh, that's something that may come in the future with uh, more conflict situations. But up until now, there's not been any problems with uh, with garbage. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> we have a question from the chat, David. Uh, but I think we are going to paraphrase it. <laughs> uh, <yes. laughs> so, <laughs> So what um, what action when when a poacher is is caught <laughs> with bloody hands? Uh, yeah. What are the consequences? Uh, what does well, it mean um, in that case? That's a great question too. Um, there is there are um, laws in place uh, laws of um, somebody going to, to jail for three years if they hunt a, a bear. Being a it's the Andean bear is vulnerable throughout its range, but it's actually endangered in in the country of Ecuador. Um, so the, the law here is that somebody would go to jail for three years if they are caught hunting a bear. Unfortunately, the, the laws here, um, as you can imagine, with the Latin American, the South American country, there's a lot of corruption and uh, laws aren't generally enforced. And, and as, as much as you try and get them enforced, it's very um, difficult for them to, to be implemented, if you know what I mean. Um, there are situations, for example, where I've known of somebody that's hunted a car, hunted a bear for a uh, eating its corn. Uh, it's a really difficult situation as a, as a researcher in an area where there are human settlements that, you know, you've kind of got to understand both sides of the coin. Obviously the bears, well, the bears, the Andean bears have been in the, in this area for over 2 million years now. And um, the human populations, the actual populations in the study areas that I've got have only been around for about 150 years. So um, it's something that we do talk about when we've got the awareness programs and the edu education programs that we give. But it's not actually the Andean bears that are invading on the human domain, as, as I mentioned. We're actually invading on their terrain. And uh, it's difficult to tell them that, but it's something that, you know, we try and do say, but you have to understand their side of the story because you need the local people to, to be on your side, to really be um, 
to try and get them to start to conserve Andean bears. So that's why we talk about compensation, talk about um, the alternative sources of income. And there are people, local farmers that I've known have killed bears, but it's not something I would go and, uh, I would uh, go and tell the police, or oh, look, this person's done this or done that, because that will just cause a huge problem as far as, um, you know, generally, if you do, if you do target somebody for doing that, because, you know, the, it's a retaliation for something that a, 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 a head of cattle will um, clothe and feed and, and allow them to, um, educate their family so it's a really difficult situation where you do have to understand them too and um yeah it's something that is delicate and we try and keep out of uh, this situation where we're enforcing the law at this moment in time because the people here are living in serious poverty in the mountain regions and um i would suggest in those situations i know it's something that we don't like to happen but the the solution to the problem is not to uh get them to go to jail for three years it's to try and almost rehabilitate them if you like and uh, try and teach them the importance of protecting nature the importance of protecting endangered species right i can imagine yeah. <laughs> right okay. any last question mm -hmm. um, then then i take advantage and ask you a last one okay of <laughs> if you could ask for anything or you had unlimited funding, maybe not unlimited funding, but if you could ask for funding for a measure that you could implement, which one would it be? What would you like to do if you had access to funding? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, uh, maybe a short term one uh, would be to continue the maternal behavior study I did briefly mentioned the maternal denning sites, which is something that's so important to the life history uh, and the longevity of the species. Um, I think it's something that's really important and something that's not um, been studied at all until we've recently started uh, studying the behavior. We, we've got the first um, video recordings and um, behavioral studies of Andean bear mothers and how they interact with the cubs in the nest um, for the first three months. and. It's something that I think is a real gap in the knowledge of, of the Andean bear that we'd really like to fill in. And I think once we've got that, we can definitely do a lot more to protect them because um, obviously with the government, it's difficult to lobby for legislation change. It's difficult to lobby for the, the um, increase in size of protected areas. But um, these areas are so important, uh, especially because they only have one or two cubs and uh, they only have a cub every two years, perhaps. And uh, for the longevity of the species, it's so important to protect those sites because if they don't have those sites, as I said, they are very selective over them um, due to the, um, they, they needs to be sheltered because the, their, their habitat, even though we're on the equator, is at 4,000 meters in altitude occasionally, which is really cold. Um, they need to be able to protect the cubs because the cubs are born at about 300 grams in size, they're tiny, and they need to be protected from the cold and the wind. Um, so those sites are very, very, um, limited and they're, very, they're getting closer and closer to human settlement. So I would really like to start working on um, finding out more about that and then being able to provide more information to governments to make sure those areas are protected. Um, I think that would be the main thing that came to the top of my head. There's many things as well, but... Uh, uh, so let's hope for it. If anyone listening now or in the future in these videos... <laughs> yeah. ...is interested, then please get in contact with David. <laughs> oh well all right so, so thank you very much david for for your talk and for your time <laughs> for your work <laughs>
maybe get into, in touch. Um, I think Fernando perhaps can pass on my email address if anybody wants to con contact me personally, if they've got any extra questions or advice or um, help that they may like in anything. I'm happy to help in anything that people may want. And uh, just, again, thank you so much, Fernando. Thank you so much uh, to everybody that's been organizing the event. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name uh, next to Fernando. I, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, too. And <laughs> I didn't want to say that. And um, yeah, it's been great. And um, I look forward to any anything else that I can do to help. I'm, I'm happy to do that. All right. Excellent. So thank thanks you. a lot, David. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, OK, so let's go to the next uh, talk. We have Christy Foster. And Christy should be joining soon. Mm -hmm. uh, since we wait, she has the right, the right link here. Uh, hola. Hola, hola. <laughs> she's not my daughter, she's a family friend, but she's a lovely little girl. <laughs> I, I listened to your Spanish accent for the first time a, a while ago in your WhatsApp message, and I was so... Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's uh, Latin American Spanish rather than uh, Castellano, but... Um, yeah, I guess so long. I've been here for so long and, uh, you know, become part of so many different communities that, uh, you know, I've almost they, people laugh at me because I've almost got like a Quechua speaking accent, you know, the people that learn Quechua and then that speak Spanish. But um, yeah, I, just let me know when you want me to cut off. I just said, told her to come and say hello to you whilst you're organizing things. You, want, you, can, you can say hi to Christy, who is about to join. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be fun because we all know each other. Oh, yeah, it's Christy. Great. <laughs> Yes, she's been uh, Castellano, but um, yeah, I guess so long. I've been here for so long and, uh, you know, become part of <laughs> so many different communities. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. You know, okay, Christy, like, you might have the YouTube on. But um, yeah, and just Great. let me know when you want me to cut off. I just said, told her to come and say hello to you last year. Uh, one of you guys has the... I'll leave YouTube. the meeting now. Good luck, Christy, with I everything. Sorry, talking. there was a de delay there, and I couldn't oh, tell yeah, who is talking at, at what time. <laughs> I just wanted to say, David, great, when you're ready. great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, Christy. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to you all soon. Sounds good. Ciao. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Okay. Now, now it will work. We were thinking that perhaps, Christy, you had the, the YouTube channel on and then we were getting a feedback. Sorry, there was a delay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. Is that better? Yes, I, I guess so. the, It might have been the feedback on YouTube. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I was trying to keep YouTube open so that I could respond to comments on YouTube, but obviously that's not going to be possible. If you keep it in silence, that will work, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, but I'll try that. It doesn't matter. We will silence. Well, we will start sharing soon the okay. video. Nice. And then we will silence here. Okay. All right. So, but uh, we are, let's introduce Christy. Yes. <laughs> introduce her. So, Christy, Christy Foster, a good friend of mine, and, and with, uh, with many hats, <laughs> she's going to talk to us today about her work with. Uh, with Terra Incognita, an online platform that collects many success stories on, on ecotourism and how you can do proper conservation uh, through ecotourism. Yes. And probably she will explain it much better in the next video that we are <laughs> to play. I don't know if you want to say something right now. Uh, only thanks for the opportunity to, to be here and participate. I think what you're doing in this conference is fantastic. I wish I could be there in person um, rather than from the other side of the world, but it's it's really neat what you've organized and, and put together uh, and really inspiring. So thanks for Thank the you opportunity. For participating. And, and <laughs> this will happen eventually. We will meet somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so let's let's play your video. Yeah. Now you have to. Here we go, all yours. Hi, my name is Christy Foster and I'm from Terra Incognita. It's a real pleasure to be here and be part of the conference on wildlife conservation and human landscapes. And in this short talk, I would like to explore the topic of wildlife conservation, but focusing on a specific type of landscape, which is landscapes used by humans for tourism. To do that, I'd like to take you on a very quick tour of three examples of projects led by three different ecotourism operators on three different continents that each contribute to wildlife conservation. So I'll just very briefly explain a bit about who we are, what we do, what ecotourism is, if you're not familiar with it. And then we'll get on to the highlights and lessons learned from these three projects. So we're Terra Incognita, and we're basically a global community of over 50 ecotourism operators. You can see some of them just here on the slide, as well as over 150 eco bloggers that collectively practice and promote ethical ecotourism in over 50 countries. Dr. Nick Askew and myself started Terra Incognita in 2018 mostly because we recognize that so many ecotourism operators worldwide, especially the, the smaller ones, were really committed to operating ethically and having positive contributions to conservation, among other things. But they were actually really struggling to be discovered and be recognized amidst other forms of, let's say, less ethical or less sustainable tourism. And we basically wanted to help. So just to start off, um, I wanted to just review the sort of common definition of what ecotourism is. So according to the International Ecotourism Society, ecotourism is responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment and improves the well-being of local people. So we can kind of think of ecotourism as having three pillars. One pillar is conservation. And we often think of that as conservation of nature of wildlife, but it's actually also increasingly recognized as conservation of cultural diversity and cultural heritage and the links between that and nature and biodiversity. And then the second pillar is, is communities. So really empowering local communities to be able to achieve sustainable development. And the last pillar is interpretation, or you might even say education. So promote, promoting more awareness, more understanding, and just more appreciation for nature and also for local society and local culture. So you can see this kind of fits in closely with this concept of, of human landscapes because in ecotourism, the human part um, and the sort of wilder ecosystem part are really closely intertwined. So in this talk, I wanna focus on three projects one in Panama in Central America, one in India, and one in the Gambia in Africa. So you can see them just in red there on the map. This is gonna be a really quick whistle stop tour, um, but I've put the links to the, the websites if you want to learn more about these projects or these companies. So our first stop on this journey is at Tranquilo Bay Eco Adventure Lodge, which is based in Bocas del Toro in Panama. And the project that they are most proud of to date is the creation of the Reserva de Guajera. So they basically helped the local indigenous community create a 600 acre municipal reserve. And that reserve serves two main purposes. Firstly, it helps the indigenous community use the palm leaves that they sustainably harvest as roofing materials for their homes. 
And secondly, it acts as a buffer zone for Bastimentos National Marine Park. So the Reserva de Guajira falls along the front edge of the land behind the mangroves, whereas the park starts in about the center of this section. And Bastimentos National Marine Park protects close to 33,000 acres. So around 4,000 acres of land and around 29,000 acres of Caribbean Sea. It covers a large portion of Isla Bastimentos and also a, sub a substantial portion of the ocean that surrounds it. And the Reserva de Guajira conserves this piece of land for both the community to use, like, like I said before, as well as protection of the wildlife that makes this area their home. So we asked uh, Tranquilo Bay to, to share a little bit about the challenges they faced with this project, their successes and also their lessons learned. So their biggest challenge was working with various groups. So that included the indigenous community, several government organizations and non-governmental organizations to put together a written plan that they then presented to the local municipal council for review and for vote. However, the biggest success was that it was approved and this area has actually been protected for going on 10 years now. So no more people can attempt to sell land that doesn't belong to them. This land is actually protected as a municipal reserve with its own management plan. And the biggest lesson that they learned is that big things can be accomplished by a team working together. And also that they, they were successful because they took small steps towards their goal on a regular basis until it was done. So if you wanna learn more about them or about this project, you can visit their website at www.tranquilobay.com. All right, our next stop is now in India with an ecotourism operator called Asian Adventures. And the team at Asian Adventures has always seen the promise of local talent, whether it's providing them training as tour guides or working with them on creating community-based tourism projects. And one example of this is the village of Choti Hadvani, which is actually the birthplace of the famous hunter turned conservationist, Jim Corbett. And not only have they helped locals set up a village style daba or, or restaurant where the guests can get an authentic cultural experience, but the company has also helped engage many locals in conservation projects, including their own elephant corridors project, which is part of their mission to save the ancient elephant corridors in, in India. So here's just a, a couple examples of their work, both training people in ecotourism and also planting trees. And if you'd like more information, you can visit their website at asianadventures.net. All right, our third and last stop is in the Gambia in Africa in a bird watching hub called Kotu Creek, where actually over 350 bird species have been recorded. So mangroves, as you may well know, are one of the most threatened habitats in the world. We've lost over half of the world's original mangrove forest cover, um, and we've lost about an estimated half or more of the original area of mangrove, mangrove swamp in the Gambia. And Kotu Creek actually suffered a severe mangrove dieback a few years back. So mangroves provide a whole wealth of, of benefits. They protect against things like weather shocks and other climate related events. They're essential to help protect local communities and mangroves themselves from storm surges, from floods, from coastal erosion. They can help contribute to sort of micro cooling and microclimatic conditions. They remove pollutants before they enter the sea. They can store up to five times more carbon than tropical rainforest can. And they're incredibly biodiverse. So here in, in Kotu Creek, they're home to invertebrates, to fish, to lizards, to crocodiles, manatees, monkeys, mongoose, otters, and a whole wealth of bird species. And they also help support 33 fishery species, as well as providing wood for homes and for community practices. So this project set out to map and then try and regenerate the local mangrove swamps. And it's run by an ecotourism operator called Inglorious Bustards in partnership with the Gambia Birdwatchers Association. 
So we asked them about their challenges and successes and lessons learned. And the biggest challenge is that Kotu Creek, at Kotu Creek, the, the dieback of Main Road is thought to be linked to the, the dropping of raw sewage into the waterway by local sewage works, and also the dumping of detritus and pollution from the tourist ind industry itself. So with offshore reefs being degraded and many coastal mangroves gone, there's also nothing to really protect this area from coastal erosion that's caused by rising sea levels. And this has led to the gradual deposition of sand in the area, which blocks the regular tidal flow, sometimes for weeks at a time. And then upriver soil from deforested river banks washes down and it clogs the River Gambia's arteries, exacerbating pollution incidents. So the biggest challenge um, that this project is trying to help solve is really around pollution. Their biggest success so far is that during the first planting phase in 2018, where they planted two hectares, a healthy 60% of the mangrove propagules survived. And so these successful techniques were then used to expand the project and plant another three hectares in 2020. And their partners, the Gambia Birdwatchers Association, successfully brought together a team of local volunteers from the local community who completed the planting in just one day, which is pretty impressive. So this project is also, it's kind of ideally located at a tour, tourism and birdwatching hub. And in the next phase of their project, they're going to develop the area's potential as a gateway to showcase the nation's biodiversity. A key lesson learned from this project is that today tourism has largely ground to a halt in the wake of COVID-19 and the Gambia is really suffering economically a great deal. So the lack of visitors that they have means there's less local vigilance and pressure on potential polluters. And despite efforts from the Gambia Birdwatchers Association, the creek is really in danger of becoming contaminated once again. So this really brings into sharp focus the importance of ecotourism, both economically and politically, to help demonstrate the worth of natural resources to the authorities and to help add weight to the voices of local people and, and local conservation organizations. So I think this is a great message on which to end our tour of conservation through ecotourism. Within ecotourism, there's really a growing recognition of, of biocultural landscapes, as they're often termed, which kind of recognize that the social and cultural and, and ecological systems are all closely intertwined um, and really quite inseparable. So I hope you've enjoyed this tour of just three quick examples of wildlife conservation through ecotourism. Um, we believe this is a really, really important topic right now when we're thinking about how we can drive more positive change for people and for wildlife as tourism resumes um, after, after the devastation from COVID. And these are really just three examples of many examples of conservation through ecotourism. At Terry Incognito, we work with about 50 ecotourism operators and they practice and promote ethical ecotourism in over 50 countries. So if you'd like to explore more examples of conservation through ecotourism, or just learn a bit more about these examples um, that I've covered really quickly in the talk, feel free to visit the websites of the operators, or you can visit our website, which is www.terra-incognita.travel. So thanks once again for the opportunity to take part in this conference on wildlife conservation in human landscapes. Feel free to reach out with us if you'd like to connect. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Yeah. OK, thank you, Christy. Such an interesting talk. It's, it's always so nice to hear you talking. It's so, so clear and nice. <laughs> I, like I think that. I talk really slowly. I speak really slowly when I <laughs> present. It was very clear, easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to hijack the first question because it, it's so obvious that I have to ask you this. So we have heard about the success stories, the challenges, and the, and the, the lessons uh, of these three, three companies. 
Which ones have been your success lessons and challenges uh, running Terra Incognita this, during this time? <laughs> <laughs> that's, wow, that's a great question to start. Um, we, actually, we actually wrote a number of success stories a, a year or so after we began. I can probably bring them up, but I think something that surprised us was sort of the amount of people that came together around this idea of ethical ecotourism. You know, once we started looking for, for companies who were practicing ecotourism and really trying to do everything that they could to help both the environment and communities, um, and obviously their guests, there's so many out there, you know, big, small, and everything in between that are really, really striving to do great work. Um, and a lot of them, you know, aren't, aren't so well known. But also we, we ended up sort of creating this community quite early on of, of bloggers and writers um, who were, you know, obviously we hear a lot about travel blogging, but we found a lot of people that were specifically interested in, in blogging about ethical ecotourism or, or more broadly sustainable travel. So kind of the, the community that we were able to build around that idea was, I think, a success for us. Um, challenges, I think, well, like, you know, the, any, um, any kind of social enterprise starting up, it's one of the biggest challenges is just the, the time you have to dedicate to it and what you can do in that in that time but I think I think in terms of what we're doing one of the biggest challenges has has been how to how to really recognize companies that are doing great work in amidst all the other stuff that's out there um, that usually shouts louder and bigger than we do or than the companies that we work with do so how to get them recognized um, did I miss the third part of your question? <laughs> Was there a third part? Oh, I can't, uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that. Sorry, we, we oh, there we go. all the time that we turn off the microphone. Uh, that, yeah. I think the last thing you mentioned was the challenge. Was that the lesson too? <laughs> yeah, okay, the lesson. Um, <laughs> I, th I think I would probably echo what Tranquilo Bay said is that, you know, getting a bunch of different and diverse people together and working together as a team allows you to achieve a lot more. So we've, a lot of the success that we've experienced has come through working with other people, not just ecotourism operators, but um, bloggers, writers, um, some conservation organizations, et cetera. Um, so all those different groups coming together, I think, is is so much more powerful than than what we would try and do on our own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank mm -hmm. you. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been expecting it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I should have. <laughs> okay, I will open the room for questions. Okay. Do we have questions? All right. Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, now. Okay, uh, so obviously you are working with many uh, companies which are working with the ecotourism. I mean, big challenge for the ecotourism is, I mean, how to uh, keep the ecotourism really eco and not change to some mass tourism, you know? What these companies have in common that it works? Because uh, it's of course challenge to bring the people to the places which are interesting but it's also a challenge to don't bring too many people there yeah. you know that it already threatened the environment so yeah. what, what is the key factor they, they use that, that it works because nowadays you have the social media people are taking the pictures sharing whatever and this just attract more and more people to the places great question <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I, maybe start with an example from where Nan, Fernando and I first met and connected was in, in Peru, actually, in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and so they have, you know, there's many examples out there in the world, but they have kind of an interesting couple stories. If 
if you've ever heard of Rainbow Mountain in Peru. So it, it I believe, at least this is what I've heard, was popularized by a photograph originally. So someone went to this place, took a photograph, and that photograph spread um, to the point that it's now a mass tourism destination and it's being degraded. Um, and in the process, it's had, I guess, both positive and, and negative benefits on the communities that live in that area. There have been some positives in the mix um, economically for them, but it, it's degrading the landscape and it's at a level that's not sustainable. So there's, yeah, the one example. Um, and the other interesting one is where Fernando and I actually met and, and worked briefly in the Peruvian Amazon. It's an interesting one because it's so remote that it's actually hard to, to get into. And so it becomes quite, maybe less so now, but it, it becomes quite expensive for people to get there. And that remoteness and the expense of getting there means that naturally there, there's sort of a, a limit, or at least there has been some limit on, on the number of people who can get there. Um, I don't know if there's a sort of a blanket approach to, to figuring out what that ideal level is, you know, where the, the benefits, you get enough benefits without, without costs. Um, but I think that a lot of it comes from companies working in the area um, and knowing very closely the area that they work in and partnering with other groups in those areas who have the local knowledge to, to understand where that limit is. Because if you're you know, too far removed from that, I don't think you're as invested or you can see the, those impacts. So I think the, the companies that we work with that seem to do this really well are the ones that are they're based where they're working or they're partnering really, really closely with local organizations that, um, that have been working in an area for a long time. Um, and so they're quite conscious and they, they almost self-limit, I guess, um, the, amount of, the amount of tourism that they're delivering. I hope that begins to answer your question, but it's, it would be an interesting one to ask each of, our, each of our operators how they set that limit. Obviously, in some cases, there, there's a, a political limit, you know, like there's a, a government limit on the amount of tourism. In a lot of the places where we're our operators are working that doesn't, it just doesn't exist. So it's, it's on them and the organizations they partner with to, to, to really drive that because there is, there is no political sustainability <laughs> um, limit. Can you say that again, Fernando? Sorry, it was a bit quiet. Yeah, we moved the, the microphone around. But it, it must be a great challenge to, to cap your business from the beginning in the name of ecotourism. So it, it yeah. limits you and at the same time, it's, it's what enables you to be an ecotourist. Yeah. And I guess a, a problem with that is that that if it if you limit naturally the number of customers it, it naturally also um, uh, favors a very special kind of customer a very yeah. yeah and then you you get lack of diversity and yes like it's yeah yeah so one one of I, I won't say who they are but one of the operators that we work with who has just a wealth of experience um in in ecotourism and actually was one of the founders of ecotourism in Peru um, is, is often in favor in some areas of, of limiting it to more expensive yeah. forms of tourism because that naturally limits the number of, of people who, who can come in and yet still provides enough economic benefit. So that's one, one approach that might work in some areas. But yeah, like you just said, Fernando, there's there's downsides to that, you know, it can even sometimes cut off local people in that area from seeing their own country. So I, yeah. I there's no easy, I don't think there's an easy solution. Yeah. Great question. 
I wish I could have invited more of our operators to come and, and get their individual perspectives on that one too. You know, I think it would have been yeah, really that was, it was very short notice and that, that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions in the room or the chat? I can ask. So uh, I can imagine that it's very diverse and complicated, but uh, do you have some rules uh, that you decide if the if the travel company can be on your net or yeah? How are you doing? Great question. Can am I okay to share my screen? Um, yes, I think so. Okay. No. Yes. You can. No, you can. No, you can. Okay. <laughs> I have the power. Uh, give me one second here. I'll just find it and then I can share it. It might be easier this way. There we go. Uh, okay. Hopefully you can see that on my screen. You probably can't read it because it's quite small print, but yes. so in... When we started out, because this this is, and maybe I should have said this earlier, and as part of that that challenge of how to recognize um, the right companies amidst all the other ones out there that are operating less sustainably. Um, when we started out, this was important to us. Um, I think because we'd seen examples of both of companies that were that were really ethical in the way they operated and and also the far extreme and everything in between. Um, so we, we started by asking a series of, of questions um, and we published the, the company's responses on our website. Um, we also, on some level, take reviews from people who've, who've visited those companies. Um, starting in 2019, so around when COVID was also beginning, um, we kind of, you know, tourism ground to a standstill and we started thinking more in detail about this problem of, of how do we find and um, check essentially that these companies are of the kind of quality that we want to be promoting. Um, so we, we did, it was probably about a year long process um, where we spoke to different companies and, and different members of our community. Um, so including ecotourism operators, including some tourists, including some NGOs, um, including a, a few representatives of, of sort of local communities or indigenous communities, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we tried to develop a, what we called a code of conduct um, with a series of themes that we felt represented what ethical ecotourism is when it's done well. Um, so there's, I, I can send a link or I can share a link um, in case it's of interest to anyone. Uh, but we basically, we ended up with sort of seven themes and there. The first is we help wildlife um, and that can be in different ways. You know, it can be through fin like financial benefits for conservation or donations. Um, it can be through conservation education. It can be through collecting citizen science data, it can be collaborating with local NGOs, et cetera. Um, the second is we work with local people, um, super, super important, obviously, in ecotourism, um, because a key goal of ecotourism is, is really to benefit local communities. Um, so I won't go through them all in detail, I'll just read the, the titles, uh, the rest of the titles. We strive for overall positive impacts I guess kind of comes back to, to the question earlier about where's the, where's the limit. Um, we share our knowledge, we work together, we respect boundaries. So things like rules and reg regulations and avoiding any irreplaceable damage. Um, and we keep improving. So I, I think all of the, the operators that we work with that are doing a really good job, there's never an, an end for them we see them each year they're striving for something better and better and okay we're going to work on this project we're going to implement this new thing this next year because you can't do it at, at all at once um, but they're always striving to be better so that's that's how we're trying to um to answer that 
that or to to ensure that the people that we work with truly are representing ethical ecotourism. Um, but there are, you might have heard of um, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. So they're not ecotourism focused specifically, but they do set out uh, quite a comprehensive sort of set of criteria for sustainable tourism. Um, so they're worth looking at too. I hope, I hope that helps answer the question and I didn't ramble too much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any more? Um, so David in the chat is asking, <laughs> where in the Peruvian Amazon did you meet? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's get out a Google map and we can. <laughs> I think I still can pinpoint the exact corner yeah. of the river. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, was it on the river or was it actually in Salvacion? I, I think I told you went there in the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, we, Nando had like exited um, the jungle essentially with a group of of students very excited after what two weeks of you guys were were living four three four three weeks <laughs> okay so they, they were just off grid completely <laughs> camping <laughs> in the amazon sounds amazing and they emerged from that and it was sort of like the first moment they were coming back to to a small form of civilization in this town called salvacion um and myself and the sort of the uh, head of the, our community team were greeting them um, and the head of our community team had the brilliant idea to make everyone dance after emerging from the jungle and so we all danced together in this <laughs> in this room in a small town so there you are it was really, it was really really nice but there was a stark contrast in body odors <laughs> 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 but yeah it was really nice in the beautiful village of Salvacia. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? No? Very yeah. good. <laughs> okay. We will let you go, Christy. I think we are okay. above your time limit, as always. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, it's been a real, real treat to participate. So thanks for having me. Um, if if anyone ever wants to reach out, um, yeah, you're very welcome to. It's all on our website, um, and I can send any links you need. So thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference, um, and all the best of luck to everyone. Thank you, thank you, so thank much. you very much, Christine. <laughs> thank you, everybody listening. So good now. Yeah. Yes. All right. We have, supposedly, we should have been now having a plenary discussion. What do you think we should do about this? <laughs> <laughs> you see how crazy it's I, I share your feelings. <laughs> I think one option is tomorrow morning we will have plenty of time and we could even arrange with uh, people listening and previous presenters to have a longer, more rested meeting. And if you want, we can, all the, the people that are here, we can meet in, in a more comfortable and relaxed way, maybe drinking some local wine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think we should yes. call it a day. Yes, <laughs> we can call it a day. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> okay, so that's it. Thank you, everyone, again, and see you tomorrow at nine. I think nine. we start at, uh, at night. Yes. At nine, we will be in the same channel, ready for action. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, and see you tomorrow. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>